Good afternoon. The next item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion 13876 in the name of Fergus Ewing on celebrating Scotland's food and drink success story. I would invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now and I call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move the motion. Presiding officer, let me seek to be helpful by starting off this debate today by re-emphasising this Scottish Government's commitment to provide legislation to underpin Scotland as a good food nation. We are committed to achieving that and I'm pleased today to reaffirm our clear commitment to bring forward legislation in this session of Parliament. This week we published a programme of measures setting out our progress all across government. It's a considerable volume of good work that has been carried out or is planned, showing that we are well in course towards the objective of Scotland becoming a good food nation. And I'm grateful, presenting officer, to the Conservatives in their motion, for, uh, amen, amendment rather, for welcoming uh, that this is a, a good, solid contribution to the debate. I'm also writing to the Rural Economy Committee to seek their views on this programme and on the Good Food Nation concept generally, as I wish to obtain parliamentary input. After all, presiding officer, there is no instruction manual or agreed definition of what makes a country a good food nation. And therefore, the concept and the reality is relatively new. It's therefore right and I believe necessary that we take time to deliberate on how we achieve our aims. And in the spirit of seeking to maintain across all political parties uh, a broadly consensual approach, I'm pleased to say that we shall be accepting the amendments today from the Labour, uh, Lib Dems and Green parties. We cannot, I regret, extend support to the Conservative amendment because it deletes the part of our motion which points out that a hard Brexit or uh, a no-deal Brexit would put at risk the success of Scotland's food and drink sector. Some of the points contained in the Labour and Green amendments provide helpful guidance on where to point the consultation on legislative proposals. It's crucial we do still consult the public and key stakeholders to further both the shape and the content of a good food nation. Presenting officer, it's fitting that this debate is taking place during Scotland's food and drink fortnight. This important annual event both supports and promotes Scottish produce and the people who grow, make, cook and sell it. Once again, the event has provided a wonderful opportunity for the food and drink industry to showcase its achievements. This year, Food and Drink Fortnight is aligned to the Year of Young People and is themed around the future of the industry. I'm absolutely committed to ensuring that young people have both the skills and the support to allow them to play a full part in the success of the industry. And I was delighted to meet some of the Scotland Food and Drink's new young ambassadors at the launch of the fortnight. These inspiring young people give me great confidence for the future. The food and drink industry is vital to Scotland. It creates jobs and wealth. It impacts positively on health and sustainability. And it helps attract visitors by promoting our food and drink around the world. And let me also pay tribute to our farmers and our crofters, our fishermen, brewers and distillers who produce our high quality food and drink. The industry is now worth around 14,000 million pounds annually with turnover up 35% since 2007 and exports reached a record 6,000 million pounds last year, up 70% from 2007. And the success shows no sign of slowing down. First, growth of turnover in food manufacturing in Scotland is double the rate of growth in England. Second, the birth rate of new businesses in the food and drink sector is higher than anywhere in the UK. And third, whisky, one of our most famous and most enjoyed exports, continues to be a global phenomenon. We ship um, 39 bottles every second of every day to 182 global markets from our uh, many distilleries in Scotland. Hugely impressive statistics, presiding officer, I'm sure you will agree. And I'm indebted to the person that computed that particular interesting statistic. At the heart of this success has been our reputation. Our brand, founded on provenance and heritage, is increasingly recognized at home and in premium markets. None of this could be achieved without the passion, the dedication, 
and the entrepreneurship of the many people working across the industry. And I value both their skills and their commitment. And these qualities will be required in abundance as we face the considerable challenges presented by the UK's likely exit from Europe. The Scottish Government has always supported the closest possible relationship with the EU that avoids tariffs and other trade barriers for our food and drink products. A no-deal Brexit, presenting officer, would be, in our view, deeply damaging and disruptive for the food and drink uh, sector, and that is made clear in our motion, which the Conservative amendment would delete. That, these include our geographical indications. It's inconceivable that we will not have our brands properly protected, such as Stornoway Black Pudding, our Bro Smokies and Scotch Whiskey. It's vital that we secure a sensible outcome, and I will continue to express our concerns to UK ministers. Would the Cabinet Minister take an intervention? Certainly. Stuart Stevenson. Um, in relation to uh, Scotch Whiskey and PGI, is it not also vital that uh, we preserve the minimum three years that whisky is kept in bond, which is an important contributor to the quality of the product? Because we know that there are pressures from other markets, notably the United States, to get that reduced to one year to thus level the playing field with their bourbon and other American whiskies. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I think Mr. Stevenson makes a, a very good point, and, uh, and I do agree with the, the view that he expresses. Um, so it is vital we get a sensible outcome in respect of geographical indications, and I will continue to express our concerns to UK ministers uh, when I meet them once again on Monday next week. It's exactly a year since I stood in this parliament and spoke about the exciting new food and drink strategy that's being led by the industry, Ambition 2030. This ambitious plan of action from an ambitious industry aims to grow the industry to 30,000 million by 2030. I have every confidence that they can succeed with the help of this government's long-established commitment to this sector. And indeed, 10 million pounds of direct investment is being provided to support Ambition 2030. Presiding officer, much has been achieved during the year, including continued efforts to promote and showcase the industry in Scotland and abroad at trade shows in Brussels, Boston, Japan, and Hong Kong. A range of programs to support businesses, such as the Supplier Accreditation Program, seeking to help business achieve BRC standard. Ongoing investment through our European grant schemes, including some of our largest grants to Albert Bartlett for a new packaging facility and Scott Beef towards a new abattoir and processing facility world-class facilities uh, assisted with support from the Scottish Government. Publication of a number of sectoral action plans covering fruit and vegetables, pigs, and just last week, venison. And more will follow over the coming months. These represent a series of practical actions to drive economic growth in the sectors. Out with Ambition 2030, we've been busy with many new policies that contribute to the development of the food and drink sector. The First Minister launched our new Food Tourism Action Plan in August in Arran, and this aims to double by 2030 the amount that visitors spend on food and drink. We recently launched a regional food fund of £250,000 to support growth in Scotland's local and regional food and drink sector. And we appointed Gary McLean as our national chef to showcase our quality produce and encourage understanding and use of healthy and sustainable food. Gary's done great work since his appointment, not least in encouraging an interest in cooking in both schools and the wider community. Yes, I will. Mark Ruskell. Well, thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I mean, there's clearly been a lot of work, a lot of groups that have been commissioned, a lot of appointments. Can I ask him about the Scottish Food Commission, the recommendations of which you received in December 2017, but have yet to respond to? When will you respond to them? Well, if I may, I'm, I'm coming on to that section in my speech, so I'll deal with it then if, if that's in order. Uh, the programme for government last week underlined our ongoing commitment to the future of the food and drink sector. We announced a whole range of actions, including that by March 2019, we will publish a new food and drink five-year export plan and bring forward new measures to promote and market our produce overseas. We will be expanding the sectors covered by food and drink sectoral plans to include beef, sheep, dairy, poultry, and craft beer. 
we will take action to streamline and simplify our support for food and drink businesses to ensure that they can access the right support both quickly and effectively. The programme also highlighted our future plans for a policy area that I know is of particular interest to many of you, the Good Food Nation Bill, to which I will now come. Our vision is for Scotland to be a good food nation by 2025, a place where people from every walk of life take pride and pleasure in and benefit from the food they produce, buy, cook, serve and eat. Our exciting new agenda for establishing a good food nation set a real ambition for improving not just the health and well-being of all of the people of Scotland, but also the economy and the environment. We established the Food Commission in February 2015 to support the work on the Good Food Nation policy. I attended their final meeting in June and thanked the commissioners for their important work to develop proposals for taking forward the Good Food Nation agenda. Recommendations submitted by the commission uh, have provided me and my colleagues with some valuable options for the direction of travel with this important policy and in considering options for the future it's become clear that legislation is not the only answer. So much excellent work is already being done across government, across local government, across Scotland to contribute to the Good Food Nation agenda. So this week I published a Good Food Nation programme of measures which sets out the full range of work that's underway. Uh, it's a fantastic record of the commitment that uh, we have to the food and drink industry, to the education and health of our people, to the sustainability of the environment, and the vibrancy of the sector's contribution to our economy. I'm proud to publish a document which provides such overwhelming evidence of the wide-ranging work going on across government to deliver on the Good Food Nation ambition. And we are not complacent. We do want to do more. The programme therefore also highlights a number of specific new policies that we're planning in order to help us meet our Good Food Nation ambition. For example, we've consulted on the recommendations of the review of school food and drink regulations, which aim to bring them in closer alignment with Scottish dietary goals. This includes proposals to further reduce sugar and increase consumption of fruit and vegetables. We're increasing the Fair Food Fund budget from 1.5 million to 3.5 million in 2019-20 and this will enable us to continue with our work to promote food delivery models that embrace the dignified food principles. We plan to create more opportunities for more primary school children to have the chance to visit a farm to raise their awareness of where their food comes from and the role farmers play as food producers and custodians of the countryside. And we continue to work towards our target of reducing all food waste in Scotland by 33% by 2025 against the 2013 baseline. Suggested measures to achieve the target will be published in our Food Waste Action Plan later this year. So these are all great examples of policies that contribute to the Good Food Nation, uh, and I confirm that we are committed to consult on that in detail in the autumn. And I welcome the contribution of Parliament, individual parties, and of course the Food Commission, which has provided a solid basis of uh, recommendations which of course in the consultation will be, uh, uh, will be explored uh, further. In closing, planning officer, I had the opportunity to visit many food and drink businesses, it's a great pleasure, and just this morning I visited the Glasgow based uh, uh, Lowman Fine Foods Limited, set up 21 years ago by Sam and Barbara Henderson, and now thriving with uh, great growth and success. They supply many of Scotland's excellent convenience stores, including with Food to Go, where they're a leading supplier, and they're taking also effective action to reduce their carbon footprint as well. This and so many other businesses are a true credit to Scotland, and they offer great opportunities for the future. The evidence presiding officer is there for all to see that the food and drink industry in Scotland is a real success story and worthy of celebration. So much is being achieved in terms of supporting and growing the industry, and it's in a good place. Uh, the industry makes an excellent contribution to our work towards becoming a good food nation, work that is supported right across government. Our Good Food Nation progress report is an excellent summary of the work being done and planned to ensure that we continue to deliver on our vision. In conclusion, presiding officer, I commend the motion in my name and hope that members can support it. Thank you very much. I now call on Donald Cameron to speak to and move Amendment 13876.1 in his name.
Uh, thank you, the presiding officer. And I'd like to begin by moving uh, that amendment in my name and also refer to my register of interest and within that register, uh, farming, aquaculture, and the fact that I'm a non-executive director of Murray Income, a company which has food and drink investments. I'm very pleased to be able to open for the Scottish Conservatives in this very important and timely debate on an issue that is of significance not only to my Highlands and Islands region, which I represent, but the whole of Scotland. Um, I share many of the sentiments expressed by the Cabinet Secretary, and I hope that with some exceptions, this will be a generally consensual debate, because Scotland rightly prides itself on the high quality offering in our food and drink sector, and that was evident at last night's event here in Parliament, which was hosted by uh, John Scott, and which was attended by many of us, including the Cabinet Secretary, where there was a small but impressive showcase from what is an incredible sector. And I was particularly impressed to hear from the four young people who work in the industry, who are all so optimistic about their future and indeed their inspirational messages to other young people that this is a thriving industry. Because there is clear evidence that the food and drink sector is growing and thriving. And I'm sure during this debate, we're gonna be treated to a smorgasbord of delicious examples of food and drink from across Scotland uh, and locally. The most recent export statistics show that exports from the manufacturing of food and drink beverages increased by 270 million pounds to 5.5 billion in 2016 and that turnover is up by 36% over the last decade. The Food and Drink Federation of Scotland estimate that a further 27,000 jobs will be required in the sector over the next 10 years, highlighting the growth opportunities in food and drink. And these are phenomenal achievements by the sector that all sides of the political divide will surely welcome. In the Highlands and Islands, which I could talk about forever, but we'll talk about briefly, um, whenever I visit a local food or drink business, they talk optimistically about their future. Uh, for instance, it's well known that the Highlands and Islands have seen a boom in gin production, with new distilleries opening in Barra, on Harris, Tyree, and Mull over the last few years. I don't want to be accused of favoritism by naming certain products, but it's instructive that the Scotland office has noted that 70% of gin production in the UK comes from Scotland, which I think is an incredible feat for our country. Whiskey should, of course, uh, be mentioned. Some members will be delighted to know that on Isla, the new Arden Ho distillery is practically in full swing with other new distilleries mooted. And it may be that the number of distilleries on Isla goes back into double figures for the first time in a long time. On a national level, we as a party welcome the Scottish Government's recent announcement to help grow the food and drink sector further and support the aim to deliver an additional £1 billion to Scotland's economy by 2030 via the Food Tourism Scotland Action Plan that the Cabinet Secretary uh, referred to just now. We all know and recognise the importance of continuing to grow the Scottish brand worldwide, and in particular targeting new and emerging markets for the various products that we have to offer. From exporting whisky to Africa, boosted recently by the successful registration of Scotch whisky as a trademark in South Africa, to the welcome news last year that haggis uh, would now be allowed uh, to be imported into Canada. Scotland's offering to the world is growing, and this is plainly to be welcomed. I do, uh, would, like to, I, I do would now like to touch on the Good Food Nation Bill, because we on these benches, and I think others, are concerned about the fact that the bill appears to have been downgraded into a program in last week's program for government. The Good Food Nation Bill is, in our view, an important measure, not only to support growth of Scottish food and drink abroad, but fundamentally to increase domestic access to it too. Introducing such a bill over the next year would be a great opportunity to join up the government's approach to food and drink in terms of agriculture, environment, health, education, planning and licensing, to list just some example. And it has, in our view, the potential to really make a difference in the fight to make Scotland a healthier and more sustainable nation too. And the fact of the matter is that if the Scottish Government wanted to embody the kind of bold ambition that the First Minister referred to prior to announcing the programme for government, they would commit to introducing this legislation sooner rather than later. After all, this bill was mooted back in the 2016 programme for government and in last year's programme for government, and it was in the SNP's own manifesto in 2016. Where has that ambition gone? Why the delay? And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's words at the start of his speech, and I genuinely have no doubt in his and the government's sincerity when it comes to their support of this policy 
I just don't understand their reticence and reluctance to get going now. Questions have been asked by many individuals and organisations outside Parliament about the rationale for downgrading this plan, and others will question why there is not a more concrete commitment to legislate soon. WWF Scotland said that a Good Food Nation Bill would provide the legislative means to tackle the significant challenges of Scotland's current food system. Peter Ritchie of Nourish Scotland acknowledged the cross-party support for the bill and said that it would set a new direction of travel for food in Scotland. Scotland has all the ingredients to deliver this, he said, and the public are behind it. We just need the political will. Both of these charities are part of the larger Scottish Food Coalition, who has, the chair of whom has described the announcement last week as disappointing. So we believe that given the positive legislation in the programme for government, here was an ideal chance for the Scottish Government to bring forward some new legislation to be bold, to be radical and to be brave. And we don't understand why a bill which commands such wide cross-party support, the backing of charities, the agricultural sector and the wider public looks like it will be kicked into the long grass. It's abundantly clear, not just from an industry, yes, of course. Madam Secretary. Um, I could I ask Mr Cameron if, if uh, he welcomes the fact that we're having a public consultation on this using the basis of the Commission report and the Progress report and that it's surely sensible with something which is novel, new, uh, where there's no instruction manual or kit that we take time to get it right, we deliberate, and above all, that we consult, we consult the public and the stakeholders, and including all political parties in this parliament. Donald Cameron. Thank you, I absolutely agree that, that we should consult the public. I just don't think that that is a reason to delay introducing a bill. So we believe that with Scotland having one of the worst obesity records among the OECD countries, with two thirds of Scot adults in Scotland classes overweight, with health inequalities which are stark, and in many cases where there is a lack of access to good quality food. This is why the legislation is so important. And while the legislation may not necessarily deliver the change, it is the key to unlocking or enabling that change. I would, in the time remaining, uh, like to um, mention geographical indicators, because we do recognize the serious concerns about geographical indicators, particularly in the context of the UK's exit from the European Union. And I don't dispute for a moment their vital importance to the sector to prevent cheap imitations internationally and to preserve the history of products and their heritage, from Stornoway black pudding to our bread smokies. And I'm encouraged that the UK government has stated clearly in its future relationship document that the UK will be establishing its own GI scheme after exit and will provide a clear and simple set of rules on GIs and continuous protection for UK GIs in the UK. And I would also draw Parliament's attention to the evidence of the Secretary of State, David Mundell, last week here in this Parliament, where he said, and I quote, it is our intention that the existing arrangements with the EU will remain exactly as they are, that we should have such arrangement, that we should, that we would have such arrangements in any future trade deals, and that we will make arrangements in our laws in Scotland and the United Kingdom to ensure that protection. I know the Cabinet Secretary is meeting uh, David Mundell next week, and I hope that this is an item for their for them to discuss. I acknowledge entirely the concern about GIs, and that's why we have mentioned it at the start of our amendment. Because, of course, the continuation of a GI scheme is not just beneficial for businesses in Scotland, but important for businesses across the United Kingdom. So, in conclusion, Presiding Officer, we think there is a cross party consensus to see major change in the way we think of food and the way that people access to it. There is, I think, disappointment that the SNP government has downgraded the food, Good Food Nation Bill in their program for government. And we believe that if the SNP really want to drive forward real change, they will bring forward a Good Food Nation Bill over the next 12 months. And we will work with them to make sure it delivers for the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would now call on Colin Smith to speak to the move amendment 13876.4 in his name. Presiding officer, food and drink is an immensely important sector to our economy and to the people of Scotland. It contributes £5.5 billion to the economy each year, a figure which has doubled since 2007. It makes up almost a fifth of our total manufacturing turnover, turning over £14.4 billion a year. In Scotland's 18,850 food and drink businesses employ over 115,000 people. It's a sector that has seen incredible growth 
over the past decade, and Labour fully supports the aim set out in the Government's Ambition 2030 paper, which outlines a bold and ambitious vision to see turnover double to £30 billion by 2030. The food and drink industry is particularly important to rural communities, such as the south of Scotland, which I have the, the privilege to represent. So let me give you a taste of what I mean. My own home region of Dumfries and Galloway is home to a thriving food and drink sector. Our farmers produce more than 40% of Scotland's dairy, and we can boast a, a range of fantastic artisan products from across the region. The importance and potential of the sector has resulted in the local Labour-led council announcing the development of a regional food and drink strategy, which seeks to double the value of the region's industry to 2.5 billion by 2030, an ambitious target, but one the region is more than capable of realising. Because across Dumfries and Galloway, food and drink initiatives and businesses are creating new jobs, bolstering the local economy and attracting more and more tourists to the area than ever before. As a local councillor, I launched the Dumfries and Galloway Food Trail, which invites you to eat and drink your way around the natural ladder of the region to discover the artisan food and drink produced by some of the most passionate people in the business, such as Creamer Galloway near the, the food town of Castle Douglas, where David and Wilma Finlay are leading the way in ethical farming, proving there is an alternative to the export of live calves and producing, I have to say, some of the most amazing ice cream and cheese along the way. Or Lochather, which I had the, the privilege recently as chair of Dumfries and Galloway's Fair Trade Steering Group of awarding Fair Trade flagship employer status, helping deliver Fair Trade status to the region. The trail takes you behind the scenes of food and drink producers, including Annandale Distillery, which after three years is now producing its first whisky, a product which I can personally vouch for. The region also boasts some of the busiest farmer markets, such as the new market at Dumfries Railway Station. We have some of the best food festivals and celebrations in the country, including the Stranraer Oyster Festival, which begins tomorrow, celebrating not only Loch Ryan's world-class oysters, but the area's culture and heritage. With outstanding restaurants, cafes, guest houses and hotels, Dumfries and Galloway certainly is the place to do business for food and drink and is playing its part in Scotland's food and drink success story. But we are not without our major challenges, as the Cabinet Secretary is acutely aware in fish processing, the region is currently dealing with the economic tsunami being inflicted on the town of Annan by Young Seafood and their decision to close the Pennies of Scotland factory, leading to the loss of 700 permanent and temporary jobs in a community with a working population of just five and a half thousand. An action plan is being developed and the proposals for economic renewal it brings forward must be backed by Scottish Government funding. The region's food and drink sector, along with the rest of Scotland, also faces the uncertainties of Brexit, which threaten our tariff-free access to markets as well as access to workers. And the question of what will replace... Yeah, sure, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. We, we leave the, the extremely important matter of the future of the employees of, of Finney's in the town of Annan. Um, would Mr Smith acknowledge that the South of Scotland Agency has stepped up the plate by providing... Um, a, a proposed programme of assistance of, I believe, £250,000, and that also the jobs fair held and the one to be held in October have provided useful opportunities for uh, former employees to find alternative employment. And, of course, that um, we are continuing to work uh, very hard uh, to see if uh, other employers can be attracted to the area and take over some of the uh, operations or new op create new operations for pennies. I just wanted to emphasise how important this is to the Scottish Government. Thank you, President Officer, and thank the Cabinet Secretary for that intervention. The £250,000 is important, requested by Dumfries and Galloway Council, but that will develop an action plan. And what will be crucial is the proposals from that action plan, which I believe could come to several million pounds, being backed by the government, because that's what will create the jobs in the area, not the plan itself. I come to the issue around the future and, 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 and Brexit, as, as, as I touched on, and what will replace the common agricultural and common fisheries policy post-Brexit still remains, I have to say, largely unanswered by both the UK and Scottish Government for a sector, I have to say, that relies very much on long-term planning. As has already also been touched on, we also face the threat to geographical indication status, which provides legal protection against imitation, and it's estimated to increase a product's value by 2.3%. Times. It's particularly important, as we've heard, to the Scotch whisky industry, our biggest food and drink export, an industry that's worth £4.36 billion pounds a year and accounts for almost three quarters of those exports, highlighting the need for a Brexit deal that retains that geographical indication status. The economic importance of our food and drink sector is therefore enormous, and so too, therefore, is the potential impact 
of Brexit. But, President Officer, the importance of the food and drink sector goes beyond its crucial economic importance. It impacts on our health, on our environment and on our record in animal welfare. And access to food, or rather a lack of adequate access for far too many people, exposes the gross inequalities in Scotland today. In a nation which provides so much outstanding food and drink, it is to our nation's shame that so many children in Scotland still go to bed hungry at night. While our food and drink sector in Scotland has grown, so too has the scandal of food poverty. Just last week, the Food Foundation revealed that over 200,000 children in Scotland live in households that are unable to afford a healthy diet. It's absolutely right that we celebrate the successes of Scotland's food and drink, but we also need to rethink how we approach access to food in this country. That means recognising that access to food is a fundamental human right. It's deeply disappointing, therefore, that last week's programme for government did not give a commitment to introduce a dedicated comprehensive Good Food Nation bill that puts tackling food poverty at its heart, despite previous pledges by the government to do just that. It's a kick in the teeth, I have to say, for the many stakeholders who have worked with the government on Good Food Nation's ambitions, who now believe they've been betrayed. More importantly, it's a kick in the teeth for those 200,000 children who live in households unable to afford a healthy diet. Of course, a good... Oh, I'll give way again if I'm I have time to do so. I, I'm grateful. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, but would Mr Smith accept, in spirit of goodwill, that I've reaffirmed our commitment to bring forward legislation underpinning Scotland as a good food nation, uh, but that some of the action to tackle food poverty is dealt with by programmes more effectively, and that for example, just as one example, our Fair Food Fund funding has been increased from 1.5 to 3.5 million pounds. And it's programmes like that that can start to, to make further progress in tackling what is absolutely a serious problem, as Mr Smith argues. Colin Smith. Cabinet Secretary, for, for that intervention, of course, a Good Food Nations Bill is not the only solution to the problems we face, but it is a necessary part of that solution. And it has, or rather, it had unanimous cross-party support. And much of what should be in such a dedicated bill is already clear. And that's what the government should be consulting on, not more process. A bold Good Food Nations Bill was an opportunity for Scotland to lead the way in environmental sustainability, healthy eating, animal welfare, and to working with our trade unions to drive up terms and conditions of our food and drink workforce, who too often can be some of Scotland's lowest paid workers. Crucially, a Good Food Nations Bill is an opportunity to enshrine in law the right to food, paving the way for a duty on our public bodies with clear targets for action, backed by an independent statutory body to ensure that action is delivered. And we still haven't had that commitment from the government to do so. President Officer, the government must renew its commitment to a dedicated, bold, Good Food Nations Bill, which has tackling poverty and the right to food at its heart. I therefore move the amendment in my name, calling on the government to do so. Thank you very much. I now call Mark Ruskell to speak to and move Amendment 13876.3 in his name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, on any night of the week in this Parliament, there are events, receptions and cross-party groups that celebrate the success of Scottish food and drink. We're dripping with opportunities to celebrate that success, but it's time we also faced up to the areas where we're failing. We're failing on animal welfare when we ship thousands of three-week-old calves each year on six-day journeys to the continent. We're failing nature when wild salmon stocks and farmland birds like the lapwing are in rapid decline with no firm plans to reverse these losses. We're failing to address the obesity epidemic with 65% of adults and nearly a third of children either obese or overweight. And we're failing on affordability too, with the poorest households needing to spend nearly two thirds of their income on food if they're to meet even the most basic nutritional guidelines. It is time to see real action on these crises, turning problems into opportunities. And the Greens, alongside all the other opposition parties in this chamber, agree that a bill, primary legislation, is the only way forward to achieve this. Now, we all understand the threat Brexit poses to protected geographic indicators and the need for continued, if not improved, protection after withdrawal. There's no disagreement there. But today, we need to move the debate on commit to what we can achieve through wider food policy and what our aims are for future powers that may come our way. Now, I welcome the Scottish Government publishing late on Tuesday evening their Good Food Nation Progress Report. It at least gives us an insight into what they meant when they downgraded Good Food Nation from a bill into a program just last week. But it fails to give us any real update on progress. 
is merely a list of ideas and intentions along with a summary of existing schemes with a food theme. Now, many of these schemes, well-intentioned, were already in place when the SNP proposed a Good Food Nation bill ahead of the last Holyrood election. So if the government was content with that, why did they propose legislation in the first place? The progress report gives us very little data and makes no attempt to track progress against the indicators for a Good Food Nation that were put together by the Food Commission back in 2015. This report is an attempt to say, trust us, we've got this in hand. Or I'm sorry, but I'm not convinced. This is why my amendment calls for targets to be required by legislation, because we can't report on progress if we don't know what we're trying to achieve and by when. And I'm hoping that we can all agree on the areas of policy that should be covered by these targets, because the wording of my amendment is lifted directly from the Scottish Government's 2014 Good Food Nation paper which stated, and I'll quote it, it's been around for some time, there's been a lot of good thinking on this. The Good Food Nation paper says, there's a consensus on the key concept areas, health and well-being, environmental sustainability, local economic prosperity, resilient communities, and fairness in the food chain. The other key benefit of legislation is that it places a clear responsibility on ministers to take forward these plans, because it is presiding officer leadership and political will that has been sadly lacking on this in recent years. And I feel at this point, we should give recognition to the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Food and the Environment, the former Cabinet Secretary, Richard Lockhead, for his drive and vision in the original Good Food Nation policy, that 2014 document. He understood the challenges in tackling the wide-ranging nature of food policy, but was not afraid to take this on, and brought together a coalition of political and civic society support. Since 2016, however, not only have we seen the issue of food drop from the Cabinet Secretary's title, but the vision of the Good Food Nation has been steadily eroded until we were left with largely just an industry marketing program in last week's program for government. Now, both the 2016 and the 2017 programs for government promised a consultation on a bill, a bill, not an approach, a bill, which never emerged. The Cabinet Secretary has had three reports provided to him by the Food Commission, and in December last year, a set of ten recommendations for a Good Food Nation bill. He's not published his response to these recommendations, yet he felt comfortable with disbanding the Food Commission and relieving them of their duties at the start of the summer, a move which, of course, he failed to inform Parliament of. Now, government needs to consult on a bill now, not just an approach, as the Minister has announced in this debate. So much excellent work to prepare the ground has been done, and not just by the Food Commission. The Scottish Food Coalition have brought the public and the food and farming sectors together to develop innovative ideas to feed into this bill. You know, we're ready to go on this now. We've got the ideas, we've got the understanding. In June this year, at the um, final meeting of the Food Commission, the Cabinet Secretary apparently told the Commission, this is, this is in the minutes of the meeting, um, and I quote, that a silo problem still existed across Scotland and that this made some legislative options difficult to achieve in a minority government. <laughs> well, the amendments from all four opposition parties today show that we are more than on board with Absolutely. this cross-silo legislation. Absolutely. The sticking block is not parliamentary support, support, but political will from the Cabinet Absolutely. Secretary himself. He needs to get out of his economic silo, get moving and draft this bill or make way for someone else who will. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I now call on Mike Rumbles to speak to move amendment 13876.2. Mr. Rumbles, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm very glad to be speaking in this debate designed by the Scottish Government to celebrate the success story, which is our food and drinks industry. There is indeed much to celebrate. So before I move on to my amendment, which I now move, I too want to mention our whiskey industry, with more than 10,000 people directly employed by the industry and with the highest ever level of exports, the industry is thriving. There are about 30 new distilleries being planned to add to the 128 already well established. And with the industry accounting for over 70% of all Scottish food and drinks exports, it's good news all round. However, I want to focus in the time I have on some of the threats we face when we are trying to grow our food and drinks industry. The whisky industry, as I've mentioned, is all about quality. It's the main reason 
while the Scottish whisky industry accounts for over 70% of all our food and drink exports, it is about quality, the perception and the reality of quality. Now, I want to focus on my amendment. Scottish farmed salmon also has a reputation for quality produce with consumers around the world. And part of our job is to ensure that it remains so and to provide for the proper regulation of the industry to ensure that it is fit for purpose. Now, members will be aware of the short inquiry by the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, which concluded that the status quo surrounding the regulation of our farmed salmon industry was not acceptable. The Rural Economy Committee has also conducted its own inquiry, and we are now working on our report. Obviously, I make no comment on the discussions around the draft report. It would be wrong to do so, but what I can comment on is my own view of the evidence presented in public session. It's clear that we all should want to see a thriving and effective salmon industry. There should not be two opposing sides, the farm salmon industry and those involved in our river fisheries. It's surely in everyone's interest that the environmental issues facing our fish farms are effectively addressed as soon as possible. Now, if these problems are ignored by the regulators, there is a danger that consumer confidence will be adversely affected, and that would be absolutely tragic for all concerned, but especially for those employed in this growing and important industry. I have every confidence that our committee, after taking evidence over so many weeks, will come to a balanced and constructive view as to the way forward. But of course, we will have to wait for our report to be published in due course. Now, unfortunately, there is another issue which threatens to undermine the reputation of the quality of our food industry in Scotland. On Monday, BBC Scotland showed a documentary about the export for slaughter last year of over 5,000 young cattle, which were only three or four weeks old, with some of them reaching slaughterhouses outside of the EU and with all that means. On the 6th of June, I said to the Cabinet Secretary in this chamber, as others did, that the concern was not about direct exports from Scotland, but about Scottish animals ending up in Spain and North Africa for slaughter. In a moment, Fergus Ewing avoided answering my question, so I would be delighted to give way. Minister. I thank Mike Crumbles for giving way. I mean, I do think an important point to clarify here is the fact that he talks about the BBC documentary, but would the member recognise that the calves that were shown there, they were not Scottish calves, and that's been a point that the NFUS have raised, and I would like that to be recognised because that is not what was shown uh, on that programme. Mike what, I, what I'm talking about, and I, we raised this before the programme, was a perception minister, not just facts, not just facts, but public perception is important here. And ministers must grasp this fact. The fact that the Sco Go Scottish government, I hoped, is, rather I'm, not, I'm disappointed by that intervention, I thought they were responding now, but I thought this is too little too late, and I hope that the ministers aren't rowing back from what they said to us in this chamber just the other day. I believe that if we find anything anything which threatens in the minds of the great British public the high quality and the very highest level of animal welfare standards of the Scottish farm produce, then we have a duty to act and act swiftly. So don't quibble about the facts. The facts are important, but public perception... But pub, the point I am making is public perception is extremely important, and it's the job of ministers to make sure that nothing gets in the way of the quality produce that we produce. Now, these really, I, 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 I'm astonished at that intervention from a sedentary position from some senior members of this parliament. These two issues of farm salmon and the export for slaughter of three or four week old calves must be addressed now before consumer confidence is badly affected. That's the point I'm making. We have before us the Liberal Democrat amendment in my name, focusing on the fact that the regulatory regime covering our fish farming industry isn't fit for purpose. This is the direct responsibility of the minister. If our amendment is voted through today, the Scottish government is duty bound to take action to reform the regulations in order to ensure that consumer confidence in our fish farming industry is second to none. The well-being of our fish farming industry requires action 
and we require action now. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now move to the open debate. It's speeches of five minutes, but there is time in hand for interventions. I call Alistair Allen to be followed by Edwin Mountain. Mr Allen, please. Signing officer, as uh, the Cabinet Secretary has outlined, Scotland's food and drink sector is one of Scotland's standout economic success stories. Food and drink is estimated to be worth around 14 billion each year to Scotland's economy, and it accounts for one in five manufacturing jobs. Around 115,000 people are employed in the sector in one of the 18,000 food and drink businesses in the country. I want to say something briefly today about what the food and drink industry means, both nationally but particularly to rural constituencies like my own. Last year, the First Minister joined the Scotland Food and Drink Partnership to launch Ambition 2030, the industry's objective to more than double turnover in the sector with the aim of reaching £30 billion by 2030. The one way to unlock that £30 billion potential in the industry is by raising the attractiveness of the industry as a career and investing in the workforce. So if I may risk singling out one initially of the dozen islands which I represent, the Isle of Harris is a case in point and has already been made reference to. The distillery there established with Scottish Government assistance in Tarbert has turned into a focus for Harris as an increasingly clear brand already for gin, very soon for whisky, and taken together with the growth of tourism, the resurgence of Harris Tweed, the presence now of a marina and other small businesses, it is no exaggeration to say that the distilling industry has helped transform, at least in part, what remains, of course, one of the most uh, fragile rural economies in Scotland. And in Lewis too, the Avangerag whisky uh, there has had a success of its own in the Japanese market and elsewhere, uh, proving what even the smallest of distilleries can do uh, to create a name uh, for uh, the brand of whisky worldwide. But part of Ambition 2030 is also uh, about the supply chain and about ensuring um, that farmers, fishermen, manufacturers and <coughs> buyers work uh, together in close partnership to ensure greater profitability is shared across the industry. And again, I inevitably think of Hebridean examples, but recent years have seen the Marak, the Stornoway black pudding, capitalise uh, in some of this way, as has the prawn fishing and processing industry, uh, and indeed several successful smokeries. There are high quality food and drink manufacturers in the Outer Hebrides which take advantage of the exceptional produce of the islands. That includes fresh and smoked seafood, meat, game, confectionery, jam, I will not continue indefinitely. It suffice to say that producers are as varied as the Hebridean Brewing Company, Callan Shellfish, Stag Bakery, Macduff Shellfish, and Bar Atlantic Shellfish. There is still more that could be done, however, to bring some of our excellent produce to a wider public knowledge. And I think uh, of the crofting uh, uh, communities here, and particularly I think of, of Lewis Lamb as an example. So the food and drink sector in my constituency is growing and currently employs around 300 people. In 2012, it accounted for £18 million in GVA for our local economy in the islands. And in many ways, the industry is closely related uh, to the tourism sector uh, in uh, the Outer Hebrides, which was worth approximately £53 million in 2013. But two of the most recent sm successful small businesses in the islands uh, both make another point in their own way. Um, they are both food and drink related. Uh, I am going to name them without any um, favours having been sought from them. Uh, Heb Mustard and the Hebridean Tea Store. But I mention them both because both are run by EU citizens, a fact which brings me seamlessly to my concluding point. Presiding officer, 40% of Scotland's food and drink exports are destined for Europe, a fact that is not lost on Hebridean prawn fishermen whose live exports of shellfish cannot afford to be delayed on international borders, but who as yet have little clear explanation as to how such a scenario can uh, with certainty be avoided. A number of Scottish products, including Stornoway Black Pudding and uh, many other products which have been uh, named uh, in the chamber already, currently already have EU protected food name status and this provides legal protection against imitation across the EU. 
This is, as others have mentioned, no trivial point, presiding officer. It is estimated that on average this status increases a product's value by over twice. It is far from clear how outside the existing schemes measures could successfully be taken to prevent imitation products from entering the market. But I look forward to hearing that could, how that could be achieved. So to conclude, presiding officer, my constituency, like I am sure many others, provides lessons about why Scotland's food industry relies equally on Scotland the brand and on Europe the market. As a parliament, we owe it to the industry to protect both. Thank you. I remind members it's five minute speeches. However, I can be slightly elastic with the five minutes, but not so elastic that elastic gets stretched too far. If you follow me, Mr. Mountain. Now call Edward Mountain to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. I think that was an indication to stretch it as far as I like, but thank you, presiding officer. <laughs> for, for, <laughs> firstly, dangerous, I, dangerous territory. That's <laughs> you down to five minutes exactly now, Mr. <laughs> I will you. keep you to it. Thank you, presiding officer. Firstly, I'd like to declare an interest, my, an interest that I'm a partner in a farming business. Now, over the 2,000-mile summer surgery tour, I saw clear evidence of how the Highland was Highlands were contributing to be, being a world-renowned producer, Scotland being a world-renowned producer of high-quality food and drink. Whether it was the award-winning beers of the Black Isle Brewery or the award-winning Dunnet Bay distillers in Cape Ness who lovingly hand-fill each bottle of Rock Rose Gin. In the remotest corner of the Highlands, you can find many companies that have transformed their passion for food and drink and turned it into a prosperous business. I want to mention the Spice Route near Cape Wrath, which is one such small business, business that I visited in my summer tour. Mike and Lucy Goodwin have taken the love of, their love of regional Indian cuisine and now sell authentic prepared meals and teach cookery courses. They were, to me, a perfect example of croft diversification, where the produce is grown and marketed locally in innovative ways. From those niche producers to the long-established manufacturers such as Walker's Shortbread, the food and drink sector is absolutely vital to the Highland economy, creating some 32,000 jobs and generating over a billion pounds for our regional economy. And we cannot forget the biggest export success Scottish export success whisky. As the Cabinet Secretary pointed out, 2017 was a record-breaking year with exports reaching a total of 4.36 billion and the 39 bottles per second that were shipped overseas is truly inspirational. Visiting as I did in summer the Pulteney Distillery in Wick and the Kleinleach Distillery in Brewer, uh, I saw for myself how distilleries are taking every opportunity to grow their customer base at home and abroad. With new names such as the Torbeg Distillery, the Brora Distillery, and the Isle of Rasse Distillery set to join old favorites, Scotch whiskey is becoming more complex, nuanced, and increasing their word appeal by becoming more local. What they might be low on this year, however, is high quality Scottish barley. It has been a very tough year for our farmers, and many of them are struggling to achieve the quality of demands of the distillers. And it must be remembered always by the distillers that Scotch is called Scotch for a reason. And I'm sure, like all members of this parliament, we'd like to see a situation where distillers source more local barley. Given the extreme dry summer, I also know many farmers will go into this winter struggling to secure bedding and fodder for their livestock to produce the quality meats that Scotland is famous for. There is a genuine fear that much needed feed will be in short supply. And this is perhaps an area where distilleries might be able to help. We, they might, and we might be able to encourage them to consider whether it's right to burn the draft they do, that they produce in the distilleries in biomass plants, when livestock farmers would welcome the opportunity to feed this rich source of protein to their cattle. We should also be concerned, I believe, in the continuing decrease in the breeding livestock numbers in, that we have in Scotland. I've heard of many farmers who are reducing stock numbers, not only due to a lack of forage, but also due to poor farm gate prices, which don't reflect the costs of production. Uh, Presiding officer. Cabinet secretary. Um, could, could I say I, I entirely agree with I think, everything Mr. Mountain has uh, said. I don't think I'd find myself saying that, but, uh, <laughs> but I think he's set the scene very well for the very serious problems facing farmers throughout many parts of Scotland over the summer. Does he agree with me that bringing forward the uh, loan assistance scheme uh, uh, as quickly as we possibly can, at least helps to provide some 
financial certainty to farmers and crofters facing these financial difficulties caused in the way that Mr Mountain has just described. Edward Mountain. Uh, Presiding officer, of course, Cabinet Secretary, I, I always welcome payments being brought forward. The fact that they've been brought forward a month from where they were five years ago is perhaps a welcome position, in, but they still need to be brought forward to November where farmers expect them to be. Now, presiding officer, as I begin to close, I would like to make an observation on the motions or the amendments that have been submitted. And there is one particularly from Mike Rumbles regarding salmon farming. And I would like to make the observation as convener of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, I believe that it would be improper for me to vote on that amendment so that I can maintain the impartiality that I believe the committee expects me to have as convener. So I will be abstaining in that vote. But I would like to say that if we are to grow our food and drink industry to 30 billion by 2030, then we need a Scottish government that matches the ambitions of our farmers and producers that I've mentioned. To reach that target, I believe we need a Good Food Nation Bill, a Good Food Nation Bill that strengthens the positions of farmers and producers in the supply chain and ensures that local produce was favoured in public sector procurement. So I have always welcomed in the past the Scottish Government's intention to deliver the Good Food Nation Bill, but now I must really question the strength of their commitment to it. Let us not forget that last year the Government promised it was working towards the Bill. We waited, and we waited, and yet it never came. That led to the Head of Nourish Scotland stating that any attempt to drop the Good Food Nation Bill would be a failure. So I call on the Government to think carefully about what they're doing, and to bring, food, bring forward the Good Food Nation Bill that all the people in Scotland heard them talk about and believe they should be delivering. Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Ms Gilruth, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, my constituency of Mid Fife and Glenrothes might not be one you would automatically associate with Scottish Food and Drink Fortnight. The main town, having been built to accommodate a coal pit in the 1940s, is still today synonymous with industry. But Glenrothes itself was built on the site of rich farmland. Farms like Caskey Berrin and Collydean became the names for the new precincts when the town was being built, almost exactly 70 years ago. In 2016, some 2,500 people in my constituency were employed in the food, drink and hospitality sector. Today's motion asks us to acknowledge the importance and value of the Scottish food and drink sector to the Scottish economy. I see that value and that future possibility in the communities that I represent every day. Scottish Food and Drink Fortnight is therefore an appropriate opportunity to celebrate the success stories of the different constituencies we all represent in here. In May this year, I was privileged to attend the Kingdom of Fife Real Ale Festival in Glenrothes. It was a fantastic showcase celebrating the ingenuity of local brewers from all over Fife. The Cool Brewing Company have their headquarters in a small residential garage in Glenrothes, which didn't stop them from scooping third prize. Cool Brewing are part of a wider movement of microbrewing, which is happening all over the country. I spoke to the sales director, Robin uh, Duncan-Dean, ahead of today's debate. She told me, the growth in the beer industry in Fife has been fantastic. We've had the opportunity to bring back Fife's rich brewing heritage and to make Fife a real centre for craft beer in Scotland. Scotland's Food and Drink Fortnight is a vital platform to help showcase the diverse talent and quality products of Fife businesses on a national stage. Microbrewing in action is a real science and the attention to detail is vital in the production of a quality product. But what I find so impressive about the cool brewing story was, not the, was the spirit of enterprise which allowed it to happen in the first place. It's a family business with a love of Fife at its heart, as can be seen by the distinctive swan logo used by the company. Cool Reservoir, from where the company takes its name, was built in 1890 as a water supply to the Hague bottling plant in Markinch. The reservoir is well known for its fearless swans, and this is where the unique swan logo was taken from. Presiding officer, Fife is also well known for its history when it comes to spirits. In fact, the earliest record of Scotch whisky was in 1494, with a direct commission from King James IV to Father John Corr at Lindor's Abbey. In more recent history, John Hagen Company's distillery was established at Cameron Bridge, just outside Leven, in 1824. Today, Hague's is owned by Diageo and makes Smirnoff Vodka, Gordon's Gin and Bell's Whiskey, to name a few. Recently, I met with Ian Brown and his wife at the Bowhouse Food Festival along in St Monans. Both of Ian's grandparents were publicans in Fife and his own father spent 20 years working with Diageo. His new company, London Distilling, caught my eye because of its connection to London links in my constituency. 
I visited the company premises in June this year to learn more about the distilling process and it was absolutely fascinating to see in action. Ian uses gorse flowers from London Lynx Golf Course to make this distinctive gorse gin, which celebrates the Fife coastline. The gin is made using 18 botanicals in total, using uh, elderflower, chamomile, grapefruit, juniper, and locally foraged wild, wild Fife gorse, from which the gin takes its name. Ian's background was in law for over 20 years, but ahead of today's debate, I'd asked Ian what brought him back to Fife. He said, Fife is where I grew up, and it felt right to start a new business here. I love the con uh, contrast found in Fife, within a stretch of only a few miles, you can be transferred from once hard industrial mining towns to incredible arable land and picture-perfect fishing villages. There are few places where the contrasts are so starkly stunning, and I think this influences the people and the businesses within Fife. Celebrating the food and drink of our respective areas is important, particularly for constituencies such as my own, which suffer disproportionately from the impact of poverty. Along the road from the wild gorse stands Leavenmouth Academy, the second highest uh, recipient of attainment funding last year from the government. So whilst we celebrate ingenuity, we should also be cognizant of a disconnect in opportunities when it comes to the food and drink sector. The food and drink sector undoubtedly creates job opportunities and employment in hospitality, but Scotland needs a food and drink sector which can be accessed by everyone. We need the inventors of the future to create the new drinks, the new dishes, the new opportunities for the next generation. Presiding officer, my constituent Nicholas Russell has owned and personally managed Fife's Balburnie House for over 25 years. The hotel is a 12-time winner of Scotland's Wedding of the Year, Scotland's 2016 National Hotel of the Year, and has been defined in 2017 by the Haute Grandeur Global Hotel Awards as number one in Europe in four hospitality categories. <coughs> Balburnie House has always employed circa 20% of the workforce from EU countries. As Nicholas Russell told me ahead of today's debate, Scotland's hospitality sector is facing profound and concerning implications stemming from any form of Brexit. Presiding officer, today's motion makes specific mention of geographical indication status of Scottish uh, produce, but I would urge all members to reflect on the people at the heart of our food and drink sector. The people who work in our hotels, the people who pick our fruit, the people we need to make our food and drink sector a success. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Gillian Martin. Ms Beamish, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, last week, I chaired an event held by, the Scottish, by Scotland's Futures Forum, our very own Scottish Parliament think tank, a debate on food and building a positive, healthy and sustainable food system in Scotland by 2030. Despite the varied background of the 60-plus people in the room, from primary producers, researchers, to campaigners, retailers, and, of course, consumers, being all of us, there was an encouraging level of consensus on the way forward most particularly on the need to join up the positive work that is already going on. There are some challenges highlighted which we continue to avoid at our collective peril. Why are so many primary producers struggling when the food and drink industry is doing so well, as we have heard today? How do we fuse the environmental, social and economic imperatives of land use for true sustainable development, matching with the sustainable development goals of the UN? How do, does public procurement and planning decisions drive better access to locally sourced and sustainable food? How can we ensure that everyone in Scotland, in all our communities, has access to healthy and nutritious food? We deliberately didn't talk about Brexit because, as I stressed as chair, whatever happens, we must address the challenges we face and make the necessary changes to our food culture at all levels. We were also encouraged to be proud of how we produce food in Scotland, and if we are not proud of what we do, to make changes. So, why do we need a good food nation, Bill? Firstly, for producers. We proudly promote our Scottish produce for export, and, just as importantly, for home consumption. But if things do go wrong, we must tighten regulations quickly and boldly to make a sector sustainable. I strongly support the Lib Dem amendment, the sea lice scandal, for one, has gone on for too long. I had an amendment to the Aquaculture Bill five years ago, challenging the industry and demanding that real-time farm-by-farm reporting became mandatory. The time to act was then. Now here we are with committee reports, one public, one pending. So let's be sure that the reputation of Scotland's farmed salmon isn't corrupted by the continued Scottish Government inaction on sea lice or on other regulatory matters. And let's not risk the jobs in our coastal communities either, whether it, for, it be for farmed salmon workers or for people who work in, in the wild salmon tourism industry. 
I will very briefly, yes, Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. I mean, would Claudia Beamish accept that, uh, that the industry and government are working together to tackle these admittedly very serious challenges, that progress has been made, that the industry has spent, I believe, £70 million on that, that we have published a fish health framework where we're working in partnership in order to ensure that the future of our aquaculture industry in Scotland is based on a sustainable footing uh, and tackles successfully the challenges of uh, sea lice and amoebic gill disease, as I believe it's doing. Claudia uh, Beamish. Well, I, I'm afraid, um, presiding officer, I just have to disagree with the Cabinet Secretary on this. It, what, where we are is not good enough, and it needs to be sorted. And I'm happy to continue with that dialogue, but I know that through the uh, report, certainly of my committee, where, which says the status quo is not an option, that um, the Scottish Government has been very tardy on this issue, in my view. However, there is so much good practice already happening, so let's celebrate it. As I did in South Scotland this week, when I visited Dam Delicious, a local family-run farm in Clydesdale. It has an on-site butchery, bakery and farm shop with a successful online presence, importantly. The livestock is free-range and the grass, they're grass-fed and they employ a team of five, some of whom have come through the apprenticeship route. The owner, Michael Shannon, has strong views on how Scottish producers should take every opportunity to champion our green credentials and the quality of Scottish produce. But we also discuss it is not just about our global appeal. We need to connect better with those at home who have the opportunity and, and can indeed afford to think about where their food comes from and what its quality is. So, with these, these sorts of examples that we've heard about this afternoon, which are good practice, let us prioritise systematically this and identify what is working and what are innovative practices, such as, for example, uh, something that I have tried to champion in my small way, agroforestry, which supports our climate change targets while also having um, a useful way forward for smaller farmers. Then, together, we can share good practice and Scotland can shape a, sy a system of subsidies which will not go on rewarding some outdated practices, but which facilitates the transition to agroecology, fusing both. And I would also highlight that it's disappointing that it wasn't highlighted in the Good Food Nation Progress Report to have any mention of organics at all. And perhaps in his closing remarks, the Cabinet Secretary could comment on this. But most important of all, as stressed in Labour's movement, in, in Labour's amendment and in Colin Smith's speech today, the right to food is a fundamental human right. And what we really need a Food Nation bill for is to address the terrible blight of food poverty in a respectful way. Bring on the bill. And perhaps a Cabinet Secretary can think again. I don't know what the precedent is, but maybe we could still have one in this session of the Parliament for food justice above all. Thank you. Thank you. I call Gillian Martin to be followed by John Scott. Ms. Thank Martin, you, please. Officer. Our food and drink sector and its reputation for quality is the envy of the world and its importance to our national economy cannot be overstated. It's estimated that over 22,000 people are directly employed in the food, drink and agricultural sector across Aberdeenshire, Aberdeen City and Murray. Um, and the North East accounts for half of Scot uh, Scotland's fish landings. I have only one fish processing factory in my constituency, McDuff Shellfish in Mintlaw, but it has a considerable international reach. Go into any South Korean bar and you'll find the most popular bar snacks are the cockles that are exclusively prepared, prepared by and shipped from Mintlaw. I, I, I love that fact. This year, to celebrate the 2018 Year of Young People, Tariff Show gave eight young business owners free exhibition stands with support from Entrepreneurship Social Enterprise Elevator. I met young people setting up businesses in baked goods production and drinks events planning. They're taking local ingredients and looking at innovative ways to reach new audiences. I've already said to Elevator that they should consider making this a regular event at the show, way beyond the Year of Young People, because the legacy as ju is just as important as the year itself. Aberdeenshire is also fortunate to benefit from Opportunity North East, which aims to deliver business growth in the region. Its food, drink and agriculture arm has a business growth programme designed specifically for owners and managers of small food and drink businesses with growth potential, as well as future leaders from larger family-owned businesses. Of the 13 companies participating in the programme this year, two were from my constituency, and both are distillers of gin. T. Smith Gin was created by Nick and Emma Smalley from Mudney Green, 
and has already won awards at the prestigious International Wine and Spirit Competition, while Blackford Craft Distillery is a family-run enterprise making gin and vodka near Rothy Norman. And you could spend a pretty good day doing a gin tour of just my constituency, obviously with a designated driver. Mm -hmm. Every month it seems a new ginnery is established, the latest delightfully just round the corner from my house in Newmarker with Elric Gin. My constituency of Aberdeenshire is also home to Glengarry, the most easterly whisky distillery in Scotland, as, one of the, as well as one of the oldest. The distillery partnered with other food producers like Barra Berries and Barra Bronzes <coughs> from Old Meldrum, Mackey's of Scotland and Mossy's Port from near Tarvis, and they together have created the Legends of Geary Tour. The tour takes visitors through the, throughout the area, sampling some of the best it has to offer before finishing at the award-winning Meldrum House Hotel for, for dinner. Um, I'm very keen to encourage the growth of food and drink tourism in the North East and I recently hosted a very well attended Visit Scotland event at Fivey Castle to promote and encourage the development of agri-tourism and food and drink tourism. Many local food producer, producers are also uh, embracing innovation and environmental sustainability. 23-year-old Ellie Sinclair of the Veg Co near Ellen won third place in the Inspirational Food and Drink Awards and she grows her award-winning tomatoes and chilies on the family farm using only renewable energy. At a somewhat bigger scale, Mackies of Scotland uh, generate three quarters of the energy they need for their production through wind turbines and they also use solar panels, biomass boilers and have a 150-acre ar arboretum to soak up any carbon emissions. Mackies and Brewdog are, of course, the huge international exporters from my constituency and are household names right ac across the globe. But for many smaller companies, um, EU countries are their most important destinations and the EU has offered the easiest and most efficient route into interna internationalisation. And I echo the comments that Alistair Allen made about the importance of that for small producers. In that context, it's crucial that membership of the single market and customs union are retained. In evidence given to the Scottish Affairs Committee this week by representatives of agricultural groups, one thing was abundantly clear, a no-deal Brexit would be a nightmare scenario. WTO tariffs of 46%. Yes, I will. No, I'm afraid you're coming, you're in your last minute, so unfortunately not. Ap apologies to, to, to Mr Carson, I would have taken an intervention if I had more time. Um, WTO car, uh, tariffs of 46% on lamb and 50% on beef would render two of our most important agricultural products uncompetitive overnight. And as well as concerns about tariffs in the events of a no-deal Brexit, there are of course worries about access to labour. Soft fruit, fruit producers and fish processors in the North East rely on migrant labour from the EU to keep their businesses going. And this is an issue that SNP members have been raising for over two years. Take McDuff shellfish, which I've already mentioned. It was only able to set up due to Eastern European countries gaining membership of the EU and many of the people moving into the area because the, the previous fish factory had shut down due to lack of ability of local labour. So the North East has much, so much food and drink to offer. We must protect the high standards, our market access, and we must shout loudly about the tourist experience that we can offer and the quality of goods we can export. But after all, we must resist the hard Brexit that has so much potential to damage it severely. Thank you. I call John Scott, to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Mr Scott, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin by declaring an interest as a food producer and farmer and pioneer of fire, farmers' markets? Can I also welcome this debate today and salute Scotland's food and drink industry and congratulate them on their amazing achievement in growing the sector? Who would have believed that Scotland Food and Drink Partnership in the 11 years since its beginning would be celebrating an industry with a turnover of 14.4 billion per year? Who would have believed that our food and drink sector would be exporting six billion pounds of goods when just over 20 years ago beef and lamb was almost unsaleable because of the BSE crisis and with foot and mouth outbreak of 2001 still to be overcome? To say that this industry has moved on is an understatement and it is the resilience and drive of those in our food and drink sector that has taken us to this position and all credit to them. And there has recently been welcome news in the fruit and veg sector with the UK government providing a pilot seasonal workers scheme to allow and encourage migrant workers to come here 
although I think we will need more than 2,500, but all credit to Kirsten here and others. And only yesterday, the UK government launched its own agricultural bill, setting out its vision for the future of rural England, which has certainly proved to be a talking point. And it is perhaps just as well that this is a resilient sector, because a difficult future lies ahead for our industry here in Scotland. Firstly, will there be sufficient Scottish primary produce to satisfy the growing demand from our processors and retailers to sustain and grow the turnover of our food and drink industry because the barriers to maintaining and growing the supply of primary produce that sustains this industry will yet challenge the processors and retailers in a way not seen in recent times. Last winter's livestock losses caused by the blizzard delivered by the beast from the east and livestock losses caused by prolonged wet weather and other factors will significantly reduce numbers of available stock going to market this autumn. The lack of silage and reasonably priced straw and distillers draft previously byproducts of our industry will continue to ensure a growing cost base in our livestock sector and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's understanding of this problem when raised by Edward Mountain. Factor in as well the proposed cuts to LFAS payments and no commitment as yet from the Scottish Government to match existing funding and the viability of most livestock units already in question will very soon be non-existent. And this will most affect our tenanted sector, where there will be many livestock farmers who will simply leave our industry this year or next, as the banks say no to further increases in overdraft lending. Another industry barrier to sustaining our food and drink sector is that there won't be a new entrance capital grant scheme next year, as this scheme has now been closed, cut short by 18 months in this year of young people, ironically, which certainly now has a hollow ring for our young farmers. And with no replacement scheme in sight, the early closure of this scheme sends all the wrong messages to our young people who are keen to take this industry forward and whose enthusiasm was much on display at the Scottish Food and Drink reception last night. Yet another barrier to the sustainability of the industry is the lack of a good food nation bill in the programme for government announced last week, again sending dispiriting messages to our optimistic and can-do food and drinks industry, and Donald Cameron has already spoken about this. And, presiding officer, a further known unknown is what our own Scottish government plans are for the shape of future support for our industry here in Scotland and what the implications are for food production in Scotland. We forget at our peril that the primary purpose of land use must be food production if we are to feed our people. What we do know, though, is that climate change itself and climate change carbon targets will add additional costs to an already overborrowed industry, with industry indebtedness to banks at about 2.4 billion, when 20 years ago that figure was just around 1 billion pounds. What we also know is that our renowned farm fish industry may face an increased burden of regulation and therefore costs following parliamentary inquiries, and that all of those farmers, crofters and fishermen in our remote and peripheral areas will need all their tenacity and resilience to hang on in there in the next few years. Certainly many rural business people, when asked what their future objectives are at the moment, reply just to be in business at all in three years' time. Presiding officer, today we note and congratulate our successful food and drink industry, but also regret, genuinely regret, the failure of the Scottish Government to give our industry the leadership and legislation it so needs to take us forward. That is why I urge Parliament to support the Conservative Amendment and decision time tonight. Thank you very much. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Claire Baker. Mr McMillan, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, I'm delighted to be taking part in this debate this afternoon. As we know, food and drink is hugely important uh, to our national economy and also the, the figure of a 44% increase in turnover to over 4 billion between 2007 and 2017 uh, tells that success story. It also highlights the, the excellent work of the former Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead, MSP, in championing the sector uh, to increase awareness of the opportunities of the sector, but also the quality of the produce. And last night's uh, Scottish Food and Drink event here in the Parliament, uh, actually it, can, it proved once again uh, that, uh, that the sector is successful, it's ambitious, and also focused on delivering even more delicious food and drink from Scotland's larder. Uh, I'm going to focus my attention on the, on the opening part of the, the Scottish Government motion, and that's the, the part uh, from the, the, the 
The Parliament welcomes Scot the Scottish Food and Drink Fortnight and its campaign this year to encourage more people to buy, eat and promote Scottish food and drink and to champion the role that young people play in the sector's success. And I'm doing that deliberately. Now, when colleagues think of uh, Greenock and Inverclyde, uh, they quite rightly will think of shipbuilding, marine tourism, the stunning scenery, uh, and also certainly some former industries, including heavy engineering, uh, sugar, and uh, electronic manufacturing. However, today, uh, there is another set of opportunities on offer, and that's food and drink. Now, we've got farming, including beef and lamb. We also have the Argown uh, trout fishery in Greenock, uh, who also uh, sell locally produced meat uh, in its cafe. I visited the, the fishery during the summer recess and, uh, and, and certainly I saw what the fishery actually meant to its customers, including uh, the father and son who regularly travel there uh, from Paisley. Uh, we also have not one, but two confectionery uh, fa factories in the constituency. We've got the Golden Casket Group in Greenock, and they manufacture Buchanan's Toffees, Millions, uh, Ferguson Chocolates, and also uh, another range uh, of produce. But we also now have the new chocolate company based at the Kelburn Business Park in Port Glasgow, which I visited on Monday. Uh, and just to make everyone aware, we're not allowed props, but uh, each speaker in the debate, including presiding officers, uh, will have a chance to sample uh, one of their produce later on as they're delivered to your offices. You uh, may have another 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I can give it to you now. No, it's, uh, they set up within the last 12 months, uh, and they offer more than just uh, the end product. Uh, they're also in including the adult chocolate-making classes and also providing bespoke products for customers. Now, Brian and Joyce Dick, uh, they employ two young people. They've got ambitions to grow the business and also continue to engage with local schools. Also in the Kelburn Business Park, there's the, the Startup Drinks Lab in the Craft Soda community. Uh, they were founded by Hannah Fisher and Craig Strachan. Now, I visited this business a few months ago and I saw another two young people with a passion for the industry of their choice, but also their business. And this week, it was announced that uh, the business park has another tenant. That's the uh, the Nut Crafter Creamery is a vegan cheesemaker. It's moved in from Bridge of Weir uh, to new premises in Port Glasgow to grow their business. And it's run by a couple who actually hail from the USA and also Italy. Now, presiding officer, the, the Kelburn Business Park has been created by Riverside Inverclyde. And the head of uh, the business investment operations, Andrew Bowman, is doing a wonderful job in helping uh, create uh, a des uh, desirable locations to help grow our food and drink offer. Now, the business park is a £5 million development uh, part funded by this Scottish Government and it's now fully occupied apart from one unit. Riverside Inverclyde uh, are also uh, building a pioneering food and drink incubator unit uh, also supported by the Scottish Government. Uh, that's uh, Baker Street Food and Drink Enterprises will be in Greenock and work has already started and it will also help create future food and drink opportunities. Then we also have the multi-award winning uh, McCaskies Butchers in Weems Bay recently uh, who completed an £800,000 investment into expanding its plant and I was pleased to, to help uh, Nigel and his team help promote Scotch lamb uh, during my visit there on Monday. Now Inverkip uh, will also join the Whiskey Trail uh, soon when their Gowan Distillery is built uh, which uh, is something I mentioned to the, the Cabinet Secretary in, a, in an earlier debate uh, a, a few months ago. And Gourock continues uh, to lead the way as Scotland's highest performing town for independent traders, cafes, restaurants and bars. Saying officer, Inverclyde is open for business. Inverclyde is creating a food and drink offer which uh, will have long lasting, positive economic and training opportunities. And I encourage all members uh, of, the, of the chamber, all members across the, uh, the political divide, go and visit Inverclyde, go and see actually, and go and taste what Inverclyde actually has to offer. I also encourage all members uh, to go on to tasteinverclyde.co.uk to learn more about Inverclyde's growing food and drink sector. Thank you very much. Yes, you've done Inverclyde proud, Mr Macmillan. Uh, I call on Claire Baker to follow by Emma Harper, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, let me start by welcoming Scottish Food and Drink Fortnight and the opportunity it gives us to showcase Scotland's quality produce. It's a good opportunity to say thank you to all the food producers and manufacturers, the retailers and distributors, our farming and our fishing industry who work hard all year round. And we have seen significant growth in recent years. Our food and drink export market is strong and we are seeing a growth in innovation, providence and variety. In my own region, there are an increasing number of locally owned businesses which are gathering recognition. We often worry about the future of our high streets, but local, accessible, attractive food and drink businesses can offer an injection to the economy of our high streets, which other businesses can benefit from. Um, I live in Burnt Island and I've seen a renaissance of the high street in recent years with a UK award winning local butchers in Tom Courts, 
uh, Scottish award-winning greengrocers and Macaulay's, an independent seafood um, fishmongers and CM Seafood, and an independent ice cream parlour, which is Novelli's. And in other parts of the region, there are more independent cafes offering choice to the dominance of the high street coffee shops. Retail is not an easy area to work in, but the passion and ambition that I can see in the food and drink sector locally is very welcome. We should think about incentive to support these businesses where individuals are prepared to take a risk and invest in their communities. As part of Scottish Food and Drink Fortnight, I went to visit the Buffalo Farm in Fife. It was a pleasure to speak to the owner, Stephen Mitchell, who has worked hard to establish the business, who is now employing 35 full-time posts and has recently opened the Bothe Cafe and Bistro. This year, the fortnight has a focus on young people and it was great to meet Adele Stevenson there, who started as an apprentice at the age of 19 and is a great example of an enthusiastic, bright and welcoming young person getting on in the food and drink industry. But there is a skill shortage in some areas and the food and drink manufacturers report to me the difficulty in recruiting good, reliable, skilled workforce. And for some producers in the food and drink sector, Brexit will add an additional challenge to this issue. But we need to do more to encourage people of all ages to see the, the sector as an attractive option. We need to encourage the sector to provide good, well-paid jobs with career opportunities and progression. We need to address any issues which is holding back growth. So it is right that we celebrate the success story, but a good food nation is about more than sales and export figures. I have spoken about food poverty in this chamber many times, and it is a fact of living in our communities which is not going away. The UK government's approach to benefits and austerity is driving this issue. It is about poverty. The lack of food is a consequence of that poverty. But we have a tension in our food policy that we celebrate the production of high quality produce that too many of our constituents are not able to buy. They are not able to participate in this food renaissance. The demand for assistance from food banks across my region is increasing. And we are getting near to Challenge Poverty Week and I'm holding a round table in the region to discuss how we tackle holiday hunger for children who miss their school meals. Alongside these concerns of poverty and food, lack of food, we also have child and adult obesity figures that are increasing and obesity is the second biggest preventable cause of cancer. For too many people, this is the sharp reality of our good food nation. I remember talking about the launch of the Good Food Nation as an ambition at the cross-party group in food in 2014. The Good Food Nation ambition must be holistic. It must be inclusive of all areas of food policy. I have to say that policy development in this area has been frustrating. Each area of food policy still feels as though it sits in isolation. There is widespread disappointment that a Good Food Nation bill was not announced in last week's programme for government, with Nourish describing it as a missed opportunity. It is four years since the launch of the Good Food Nation. It's two years since the government announced their intention to bring forward a bill. They have received recently work from the Food Commission, but there is still little evidence that concerns about a lack of cohesion across government on food policy are being addressed. This lack of a strategic approach that recognises and deals with the tensions and different objectives that are across departments and responsibilities hampers us in really addressing the issues of sustainability, diet, food poverty, production and access, among others. And the Cabinet Secretary today made no mention of a healthier future, Scotland's diet and healthy weight delivery plan that was published earlier this summer. And then those debates around obesity and around diet, they make no mention of the Good Food Nation. And it just feels like there's no joint working going on. The Parliament has previously been bold in areas of public health. We may not have always agreed, but we have introduced legislation to tackle smoking and excessive alcohol consumption. And when the First Minister announced a commitment to halve childhood obesity by 2030 in May, that sounded like an ambition that would be at the heart of a Good Food Nation bill. A commitment to, and I quote from the Progress Report published this week, to publish a separate consultation this autumn on how best to create and deliver an appropriate statutory framework does not inspire confidence. These are measly words where there should have been a clear commitment to an ambitious food bill. A whole government approach needs to be adopted. There needs to be clear goals and leadership. We need a radical bill that could transform Scotland's food culture and improve the health, the environment and the economy for Scotland's people. I urge the government to get on with it. Thank you. I call Emma Harper to follow by Peter Chapman, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be able to speak and welcome today's debate during the Food and Drink Fortnight. 
Scotland's food and drink industry is vital to the rural economy, as the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned. And I'm delighted to welcome the Scottish Government's ambitious plan to expand it further. Building a brand Scotland is key to achieving that aim. Many people are becoming increasingly aware of how important provenance, sustainability and country of origin label are to the industry. This issue was raised with me by NFU leadership again this summer. And in my South Scotland region, we have outstanding local produce such as Galloway beef and the award-winning cheese at the Ethical Dairy. Ethical Dairy has gained much publicity this week due to their practice of keeping calves with their mothers. And this week, Marie Goujon agreed to visit Ethical Dairy and I can also help support and encourage other engagement with many of the other dairy farmers who wish to share their different on-farm practices. Additionally, I can speak about Loch Ryan oysters from Stranraer, which I'm pleased to be celebrating along with the Minister this weekend at the Stranraer Oyster Festival. Members might be surprised to learn that in Dumfries and Galloway, Garacher Tea Garden is growing and blending tea, and Professor Pod and Galloway Chilies are both growing chilies and making jam, chutneys, marinades and salad mixes. Our award-winning dairy produce is wide-ranging, from amazing ice cream to specialist cheeses and yoghurt, and not to forget the world-famous Ayrshire Tatties. The food and drink producers from farm to fork in the southwest are extremely talented and innovative people innovative people who make an invaluable contribution to the local economy. And this includes Station House Cookery School in Kirkubri, as he's trying to engage people in getting around the table and cooking their meals. All these businesses should be supported and celebrated. I regularly attend and buy local products at the Dumfries Farmers Market, which was recently awarded £5,000 from the Scottish Government's Regional Food Fund. The SNP government is to be credited for helping make Scotland's food and drink industry what it is today. With the industry turnover increased by 44% since 2007, it's great that exports have increased by 56%, reaching over £6 billion last year. Our manufacturing growth rate for food and drink is twice that of the UK. And key to unlocking the £30 billion potential of the sector is supporting the workforce. Our fishermen, farmers, growers, pickers and all those working in our agricultural sector need to be supported. I spent the summer recess visiting farms, attending agricultural events and speaking to farmers at the front line. I found that the future of staffing on many of the dairy farms is a huge concern. We know that South West Scotland has 43%... Of course I will take an intervention. Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. Fergus Ewan promised a Good Food Nation bill back in May 2017. The commitment to a Good Food Nation Bill was included in the 2017 programme for government. It was maintained in uh, January, but this uh, year's uh, programme for government doesn't include a Good Food Nation Bill. And many of the amazing food producers in Galloway that you have mentioned see this as a missed opportunity. Would you agree that this SNP government likes to create headlines about what it's going to do, but a year or two down the road, it fails to deliver? I'll give you a little bit extra time. That was a long intervention, Emma Harper. Mr Carson, I can't speak for the government. I'm not the government and uh, I would be happy to, I'm sure you've heard that the government have heard you and we can move on, thank you very much. So I have issues with uh, the seasonal workers um, that are in our country and the UK government has a commitment to add 2,500 seasonal agricultural workers but that doesn't address the full-time workers on our dairy farms. They're not seasonal, they live here and they're part of our rural community. That's why it's so important to have an immigration bill that's devolved to Scotland so we can do what we have to do with our own growers, pickers and dairy farm workers. As we face the hard and worrying realities of the Tory Brexit, we must do everything possible to support our rural industries to become more sustainable and resilient. 69% of Scotland's overseas food and exports go to the EU. And I'd like to touch on briefly Donald Cameron's statement about what Secretary of State David Mundell said at committee last week. I sit in that committee and um, David Mundell said that he is determined to achieve support of PGI. But the very day before, when George Holmbury, the Trade Minister, was at committee, he said there are several other products that we'd like to protect that just don't have sufficient 
market penetration to warrant GI status in the market. The GI issue is not particularly straightforward. These are not the same reassuring words of the Secretary of State. I would think the, Scot the UK government needs to maybe actually talk to each other and decide what's the best way to support our PGI. Presiding officer, I would like to conclude by saying I echo the concerns of the industry over support port post-Brexit and therefore encourage the Scottish Government to continue to press for the best possible outcome for our farm to fork businesses. Peter Chapman followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank, you, Scott, uh, uh, thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, and before I begin, I must declare an interest as a partner in the farming business. Parliament has only been back after summer recess for two weeks, and already I have met with some of the key players in Scotland's food and drink success story. Last week, I attended a reception held by the Scotch Whisky Association, and Scotch Whisky has enjoyed record-breaking exports in 2017, growing in both volume and value to a total of £4.36 billion. Last night, I attended an event hosted by the Food and Drink Federation Scotland, discussing the diversity of careers available in this ever-growing sector. The food and drink sector now employs over 45,000 people, which equates to an astonishing 25% of Scotland's manufacturing workforce. The target set out to grow our food and drink industry's worth to 30 billion by 2030 is ambitious, and it is wholly reliant on the production of the raw materials on which our iconic food brands are built. And these raw materials are, of course, produced by our farmers and fishermen. However, our farmers are rightly concerned that up until now they have not shared in this food and drink success story or seen any reduction in the continued pressure on their margins. The Scottish farming industry must grow and prosper along with the rest of the sector. And the prize that Bre Brexit offers is the opportunity to design our own support system better suited to our farmers' needs. We all know the cap is flawed, and we can do better. However, this opportunity has not been grasped by this government, but rather Brexit is being used as a delaying and scare tactic. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear. I believe the SNP wants Brexit to fail to further their own political agenda. Mm -hmm. yes, if you wish. Mary Guzio. I have to say that I absolutely object to Peter Chapman's statement there when this government at every single stage has done nothing but go out of its way to work with the UK government at every level to try and work in the best interests in the people of Scotland and at every single turn we have been ignored. Yeah. Peter Chapman. I completely and utterly reject that. That is not what we have seen at all from this side. They've all done everything. They've done everything to build up grievance between this place and Westminster all along the whole process. No, not at all. Let's be clear. I'll say it again. I believe the SNP wants Brexit to fail to further their own political agenda. This was clear in June when months behind schedule they released another consultation with more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. Our farmers need a clearer outline of how this SNP government will structure and develop its own agricultural rural policy. Yes, I have no time, I'm sorry. Yes, stability is needed in the short term. But where is the long-term vision for this industry? In the past two weeks, this government has cut the new entrance capital grant scheme with nothing to replace it. The Cabinet Secretary has warned that LFAS will be cut by 20% in 2019 and 80% in 2020. Another scare tactic, as it is in his hands to decide what support Scottish farmers should receive. So I call on the Cabinet Secretary to start making decisions and stop scaremongering. Fergus Ewing. Well, can I just remind Mr Chapman that I said in this chamber, and I repeat it now, and I've said it to local farmers and NFU members, that we are absolutely committed to finding a way to avoid that reduction in LFAS from 80% to 20%. Peter Chapman. I, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's words and I hope that he gets on and, and does exactly what he says and, and, and makes something happen. The announcement that, uh, that farmers will receive 90% of the basic payments in October is also helpful. 
as this will provide a much needed gas injection to many under pressure due to the huge rise in feed and fodder prices caused by the summer drought. So while I welcome this, it is no more than was done last year. So it in no way addresses the serious increased costs facing livestock farmers this winter. Our farmers deserve better, our farmers deserve more. For example, I wrote to Mr Ewing, asked him to support the NFUS proposal to request a derogation of the three crop rule and a shortening of the EFA follow period from the European Commission. These measures would have had a significant positive impact for our farmers' ability to plan ahead and to alleviate the extreme shortage of winter feed. These derogations would have cost the government nothing, and yet no action has been taken, and I haven't even received a reply. So where do we go from here? The Threadbare Programme for Government has not a mention of an agricultural bill, showing complete disregard for our farmers. Presenting offers, officer, in the short time left, I need to speak about the important part our fish sector adds to our food and drink industry. Many people are unaware of the fact that our biggest food export is not beef or sheep, but farmed salmon. We produce 177,000 tonnes of salmon, and much of this is exported to 60 countries right across the world. And our fishermen work hard in often dangerous conditions to put food on our table. Two thirds of the world's longest teams are sourced in Scottish please, waters. Mr. Chapman. I will come to a finish. I will also, I would just would like to say at the end, the, the, the SFF and the NFUS have got behind the UK government checkers plan. This is the only plan on the table and the you must finish, please, and Mr. Chapman. trade right across Europe. And if the SNP were in any way supportive of... You must people, finish now, please, Mr. Chapman. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, can I say to members that when I ask people to finish, there's a reason for that in the interest of the debate. And I would expect not to have two or three paragraphs after that request. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. And I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Angus MacDonald. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, interesting to talk about the Chequers plan and demand the SNP get behind it. Well, I'll be interested to hear when the Conservative Party gets behind it. The Conservative Party have at least six different views on the Chequers plan. But I'm not going to waste time on the Conservative Party's internal difficulties, which at every turn they try and reflect on to others who are trying to do the right thing for Scotland. Our uh, food and drink fortnight is an uh, absolutely excellent example uh, of Scotland, I think, coming together, and mostly this debate has done so, uh, to promote uh, the great quality food that we produce uh, in our country. Uh, I agree with Mr Chapman about the importance of salmon farming. It's by no means uh, the only uh, food, ex food and drink export we have. We've heard from others about it. Our uh, vision as a good food nation is one which in this year of young people uh, we should relate uh, to the contribution of future generations in particular. Uh, James Withers, the chief executive at Scotland Food and Drink, said, now is an exciting time to be involved in the sector in Scotland. The opportunity for the next generation to raise the bar even higher is hugely uh, compelling. And I absolutely agree uh, with James. On Tuesday this week, uh, Austin Wilkins joined me as, he's, as a new intern from the United States. And he's told me he participated uh, at secondary school in an organization known as the Future Farmers uh, of America. Uh, that organization seeks to educate people on where their food comes from and to value uh, their food better. Uh, apparently, uh, when surveying a group, uh, the one person asked whether only brown cows can make chocolate milk. That's a classic example, uh, humorous as it might seem to be, uh, of the disconnect between people's understanding of food and the real importance of food. We've got a huge number of people, perhaps just approaching 20,000 people in our uh, food and drink business. Uh, we have 20,000 businesses employing uh, well over 100,000. But Brexit, whatever its outcome, uh, is currently overhanging uh, our industry and its success. I only need to think of live langoustines, uh, the premium product that comes from the Northeast largely, 
that go on the buggy to Boulogne sur Mer market uh, once a week. If they arrive at 8 o'clock in the morning, they get the price that they command by the quality that they are. If they're delayed even till 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they get half the price they would have got at 8 o'clock in the morning. The real challenge is how long are they going to be waiting in the queues uh, to get into France and get to Boulogne sur Mer? That is the real practical risks if we don't get Brexit right. Now, geographic uh, indication status is very important to many of our uh, great Scottish uh, products. Uh, Scotch whisky, in particular, uh, is one uh, which has been well regarded around the world for well over a century. Since the uh, 1915 Immature Spirits Act, which my cousin took through uh, was responsible for in Parliament, um, the whisky has been kept in bond and that has improved its quality. Previously, I referred to the desire of the American uh, whisky industry uh, to have us abandon that three-year uh, storage and go down to one to level the playing field with them. There are challenges to whisky around the world. Uh, when I first went to Nepal many years ago and I walked down the Durbar Mark, the main street in Kathmandu, uh, you could see in the windows something that superficially looked like VAT 69 whiskey, but it wasn't. It was CAT 69 with a K carefully drawn uh, to obscure the fact that it was Nepalese whiskey. We are copied all over the place. There's a huge second-hand market in uh, Johnny Walker bottles uh, in India. Uh, and when I asked for whiskey in Burma 40 years ago, it was purported to be Scotch whiskey, but had the faint flavour of paraffin. It'd been made out the back the night before. One of our great industries in my uh, constituency that sounds as if it's a, a simple one is potatoes. Seed potatoes in my constituency is an eight figure a year industry. It's one of many. Let's support them all. Presiding officer. Uh, the last of the open debate speakers is Angus MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. And can I say at the outset how pleased I am to be speaking in this debate as Scotland's food and drink is certainly worth celebrating. And as we've heard from previous speakers here this afternoon, Scotland has an incredibly successful food and drink sector worth billions to our economy and providing thousands of jobs across the country. From growers and producers to processing and end product services, we have much to offer the world when it comes to food and drink. Indeed, um, I haven't shared this previously with the Chamber, uh, as far as I can recall. However, uh, my own family history has or, or had a part to play in Scotland's food and drink success story, having produced Stornoway Black Pudding for over eight decades. Um, now, Stornoway Black Pudding got a, a wee mention yesterday during Rural Economy Portfolio Questions when Dave Stewart stated that his fondness of Stornoway Black Pudding or Marrick in Gaelic it hadn't affected his waistline. Well, sadly, I can't say the same. <laughs> however, however, I think it's probably fair to say that I do play my part in boosting our economy by buying and consuming Scotland's first-class products. Sadly, uh, we wound down our wholesale and retail meat businesses in Stornoway in the mid-2000s, uh, mainly due to competition from the supermarkets and the resultant <coughs> changes in purchasing habits on the islands. Uh, but I'm glad to say that three black pudding producers in Stornoway still valiantly manufacture the Marrocks uh, and seem to be going from strength to strength. Uh, of course, all that is at risk if we fail to keep geographical indication status for Stornoway black pudding and as well as uh, 13 other Scottish products. And UK ministers have unfortunately continually failed to give an assurance regarding PGIs and the protected food names uh, scheme. Sadly, the lack of clarity being shown by the UK government, coupled with the frequency in which the media is reporting apparent future trade deals being discussed, where PGIs are either an afterthought or not deemed to be important, is creating some real concerns from many stakeholders across Scotland. And it's so, uh, hoped um, that there's no truth in the rumour, although I suspect it is correct, that Scotland's produce with geographical indication status are seen as a bargaining chip by the UK government. However, I guess we'll know fairly soon whether that's the case or not. Of course, closer to my home these days in Falkirk District, it would be remiss of me not to mention the successes we have locally. <coughs> uh, from early beginnings with Robert Barr producing the first iron brew in the 1800s, 
and undisputedly the king of the lowland whiskey uh, from Rosebank Distillery, being produced as far back as 1819 to modern day production at Malcolm Allen's Butchers and Mrs Tilly's Scottish Confectionery Falkirk District has much to offer and much to be proud of. Malcolm Allen Butchers, for example, produced 54% of Scotland's Lorne sausage, an average of 50 tonnes of sausage per week. Uh, and uh, just as an aside, over Christmas and New Year, they provided uh, lawn sausage and steak pies to soldiers from the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards stationed in Cyprus to help ensure they had a reminder of home while on tour of duty. Having moved on from uh, a couple of family butcher shops in Falkirk and Kirkintilloch to now supplying most of Scotland's major supermarkets, it's clear that the only the best produce from a lineage of quality service and family ethos has ensured Malcolm Allen's limited, uh, Malcolm Allen limited success in becoming one of our most loved household names. But if you're uh, more of a sweet tooth, then perhaps after your Malcolm Allen steak pie, a wee bit of Mrs Tilly's tablet will, sure, uh, will cure the craving. Um, now, we all know that tablet, especially those treats made by Scottish Government ministers, uh, can send certain members of opposition parties into a sugar-induced frenzy. Uh, so before I continue, I would say to all, everything in moderation as part of a healthy, balanced diet. Uh, Mrs Tilly's originated in my friend and colleague Keith Brown's constituency in Tillicutri, uh, however has expanded across the Forth Valley to Larbert and from early beginnings it has uh, uh, become one of Scotland's success stories. Uh, with all of this success however comes the responsibility of creating the environment where our food and drink sector can develop, expand and continue down the path of sustainable success. Scotland clearly has a reputation for quality produce ranging from our salmon and whisky industries right down to our meat and soft fruits. A Brexit inevitably poses a threat to our industries and the continued uncertainty is not good for anyone. That's why we should be taking steps to ensure our industries are underpinned by the security of access to the single market and customs union and I reiterate calls upon the UK government to take steps that will secure Scotland's industries and provide the certainty that is so badly needed right now and for the future. Um, presiding officer, there's clearly a lot more to say um, but in closing I, I had hoped to touch on some good practice in Denmark as an example of, uh, uh, of, of where we should be looking to go. Uh, however, time is limited. So suffice to say, our food and drink sector's success is down to the high quality pr produce and focus on sustainability that is known the world over. We can and should do everything in our power to ensure that this is protected from whatever threats are on the horizon and to ensure that the success is replicated and sustained for the future of the industry, close, the nation please. and our citizens. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches. Uh, disappointing to note that not everyone who contributed has returned to the chamber for the start of those. However, I call Mr Rumbles, Mike Rumbles, for six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> now, I didn't want this debate to be focused yet again on Brexit, although some contributors tried to do that. But, we, I mean, we all know the threats Brexit poses. But I wanted to ensure that this debate focused where it should be, on supporting our quality food and drink industry and on what the Scottish Government needs to do now to ensure that we maintain this deserved reputation of both quality and the highest level of animal welfare. In my opening speech, I identified two areas where the Scottish Government needs to take action urgently, and in particular on ensuring that we have an effective regulatory system for our fish farming industry, which is clearly not currently fit for purpose. I appreciate the government's support for the Liberal Democrat Amendment, but this must be followed by action, rather than just a vote, action to put the regulatory system right. Now, um, Donald Cameron focused our Parliament's concerns on why the Good Food Nation Bill was dropped from the programme for government, and this is why all four opposition parties are united about not wanting to see it kicked into the long grass, and that's why we will support all the amendments before us today. Colin Smith um, rightly uses time to focus on tackling food poverty and jobs in the industry, as did Claudia Beamish. Now, Mark Ruskell, now I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Mark, Mark Ruskell, for working with me and others to get the Parliament to focus on what the Scottish Government can do to support our food and drinks industry and get the Scottish Government to actually take action to address the problems and produce legislation. He worked very well, and if it hadn't been for Mark, maybe we wouldn't all be 
supporting all the amendments. Now, I don't know if my compliments to Mark will help or hinder him within his group, but I notice they're not here, so maybe they haven't heard. So I think you're all, you're all right, Mark. Um, in my opening contribution to the debate, I was, I have to say, astonished at Mari Gujan's intervention on me when I raised the issue of the export for slaughter of over 5,000 young calves last year, many of which ended up for slaughter out with the EU in North Africa and with all that that entails. I couldn't quite believe that what she said was the calves on the BBC programme were not Scottish. She didn't comment on the fact that last year 5,000 were Scottish. And when I said the facts are important, but what is equally important is public perception, I was unbelievably barracked by some MSPs from the SNP benches, and one particular who isn't in the chamber at the moment. I won't name them because I thought it was rather poor. My goodness, this is the whole point of my amendment. The fact that we have quality produce raised to the very highest welfare standards must not only be true, but be seen to be true. The facts and public perception. The public perception of the great British public is really important. If we don't understand that, and if our government ministers don't understand that, then our food and drink industry could be compromised very quickly indeed. Now, across this whole chamber, we are all agreed, surely, on how important and our food and drink industry is, and it is a real success story. And every contributor to the debate has made that point. However, we are failing in our duty, though, if we only engage in backslapping about how well our industry is doing in our own particular constituencies or regions. Surely this is our opportunity also to highlight problems, but solutions to problems that are facing us. And there are problems. If we don't address them as soon as they arise, we are doing nobody any favors. Deputy Presiding Officer, I repeat, we have a good story to tell about our Scottish food and drinks industry. This can all be undone by failings on one or two areas. As soon as the problems appear, the Scottish Government must act quickly to put them right. I've identified one of these issues in my amendment this afternoon, and I would urge all members across the chamber to support it. Thank you. I now call Mark Ruskell for six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, we've effectively had two debates here this afternoon. One, which has been about celebrating the success uh, of our artisan food producers across Scotland, and members have brought in many examples of that. And another debate about the policy direction of the Scottish Government, and perhaps the lack of progress that we've seen there as well. Now, you know, members have taken us on a heady tour. We've been to gin distilleries and uh, whiskey distilleries and black pudding. We've had offers of toffee uh, coming from the SNP backbenches as well. Um, but I think it's important that the Scottish food sector is inclusive. Uh, Jenny Gilruth raised the issue about the disconnection of opportunity, particularly of young people who want to find livelihoods working in the food sector. And Claire Baker also highlighted the skills gap that exists and the opportunity, again, to bring young, disadvantaged young people uh, into this success story. And I think it's important that, you know, when we're looking at... Uh, the indicators for success of the Scottish food sector, that it's not just about gross value added, it's not just about the size of the food sector, it's about what that food sector actually does. Now the Scottish Food Commission um, commissioned a, an interesting piece of work, actually back in 2015, you know, there's a lot of work, good work's been going on here, looking at what the indicators for success should be within our food sector. And they did point out uh, an indicator, a good indicator, would be the proportion of jobs paid the living wage in the food and drink sector. They also point out another indicator, the incidence of skills gaps in the food and drink sector. So it's important when we're looking at the success that we define it not just in terms of how big it is, but also what it does and how inclusive it is as well. Now, a number of members have um, focused, rightly, I believe, on the need for a piece of primary legislation, a good food nation bill. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary said, you know, there isn't an instruction manual for this kind of thing. Well, I agree there isn't, but there's been some very good work done by bodies like the Scottish Food Commission and the Food Coalition, many of which have been set up uh, with the support of, of government ministers. We need to carry that through. 
Now, Colin Smith talked about uh, the scandal of 200,000 children going to bed hungry. And Claire Baker, again, talked about the, the holiday hunger that many, many families in our communities face. Um, and that's why it's important that with this Good Food Nation bill, that we have a right to food within that bill, that public bodies that are looking after vulnerable people ensure that that right to food is, is carried out and delivered, whether that's through education, programs around cooking, whether it's about the provision of high quality school meals during term time or potentially during um, the holiday periods as well. Uh, it's important that Good Food Nation bill addresses these issues uh, of social equality. Now, I'd like to turn briefly to the, the issue of uh, protected geographic indicators. Uh, I think it's welcome that the Cabinet Secretary has put pressure on multiple UK government ministers to move on this. And I do welcome the fact that the Tory amendment does actually commit uh, to strengthening PGI and strengthening a replacement for PGI post-Brexit. I do hope that those uh, benches will now follow through on this if it's passed tonight through to lobbying and through to lobbying the UK trade minister as well I think if you get that passed tonight there's a united voice from Parliament to embolden you to make that case that we need to ensure as Angus MacDonald said that it doesn't become a bargaining chip in the Brexit negotiations now one PGI uh, standard of course that we've got that's been a huge success story is Scotch beef um, and perhaps I would say to the, the to the new minister that perhaps looking at that uh, taking some leadership on, on the issue of accreditation of rosé veal uh, and how that might fit in with the, the Scotch beef label might perhaps provide part of the solution that she is looking for in relation to dairy calves. It shouldn't just be about shipping or shooting. We could actually have an ethical uh, product. We could even be selling it in this parliament as well. Um, I'd like to finish, um, presiding officer, just by turning to some thoughtful points made by both Mike Rumbles and Claudia Beamish about quality and about sustainability of our food. Now, I, I recognize the vital importance of the salmon farming industry to our highlands and islands, not just for this generation, but for future generations to come. And I think that's why we're all concerned about the deep-seated problems that this sector has right now, from animal welfare, from disease, from the sea lice, which Claudia Beamish accurately predicted we needed to be uh, monitoring several years ago. We didn't do that, and now look where we are now. Um, the culling of seals, which could lead to an export ban for Scotch salmon in the US, and the impact on our wild salmon stocks. Um, we all await with interest um, a much bated breath, the report that will come from the REC committee. Uh, but it's important that this report doesn't just sit on the, on the shelf. We know that SEPA are undertaking a sector review of, of salmon farming in the months to come. It could change the way the sector is regulated to protect the environment. It's really important that Parliament continues to get a grip on this issue. Uh, and although we have an iconic product in Scotch salmon, it's in trouble. Consumer confidence is in trouble. We need to address these issues. So, presiding officer, I think it's important now that we take the vision of a good food nation and actually make it a reality. Economically successful, socially inclusive, environmentally responsible. Let's see a bill in the next year. I now call Alex Rowley for six minutes, please. Presiding officer, this has been an interesting debate with a number of good points made across the chamber. There are, of course, many areas where we can all agree not least on the, our world-class product, as highlighted by many speakers, Emma Harper, Claire Baker, Jenny Gilruth, and Stuart McMillan. However, there has also been disagreement and controversy, particularly due to the government's backtracking on the Good Food Nation Bill. I heard what Fergus Ewan said, but I would have to say the concept was actually put forward as a bill proposal as one of the many so-called radical announcements in last year's programme for government. So like Donald Cameron, Mark Ruskell, Mike Rumbles and others, I just don't understand what the delay is. In the spirit, however, of cooperation, let me say to the Cabinet Secretary that the bill that should come forward should address issues of sustainability, food poverty and healthy eating and should in doing so encourage links across portfolios in government. Specifically, as mentioned by Colin Smith, the bill should incorporate the right to food into Scots law and if it does not then certainly Scottish Labour would bring forward an amendment to do so. We know that we have a right to food in international law, 
but without protection in our law, it can't be enforced and it can't underpin policy and practice. Bits and pieces of legislation is not good enough. We need an overarching bill. As we have heard in the debate, the right to food is a right for everyone to be able to eat well and to have food and a food system that treats people, livestock and the planet fairly. This means food should be available to everyone regardless of geographical or financial barriers that they may face. In other words, everyone should be able to have access to and be able to pay for food. And not only that, the food which is on offer should be nutritious, safe to eat and respectful of the many cultures that make up modern Scotland. Food production in Scotland should be sustainable, ethical and carried out using methods that protect and preserve our natural environment and resources so that we can produce food now and into the future. This will require a whole system approach to supporting our farmers and food producers so that they can be part of that transformation. None of this is yet a reality in Scotland. So we absolutely need a right to food in Scots law to create a legal framework that, to quote, nourish Scotland, respects, protects and fulfills food rights. Presiding officer, we have also heard today about food poverty. And like Claire Baker, I want to spend some time on the issue of food poverty. This is particularly important given the figures show that more than 200,000 children are now living in households that are unlikely to afford a healthy diet. We also know that one area of growth in our towns and cities is food banks. The Trussell Trust reported earlier this year a 17% rise in the use of food banks in Scotland from the previous year with low incomes, benefit changes and benefit delays being cited as significant factors for people who find themselves having to seek help to, sacrifice, to satisfy the fundamental human right and requirement of having enough food to eat. Despite the fact that the Trussell Trust described universal credit as being a significant factor, the Tories in Westminster still refuse to halt the rollout and in this parliament, the policy is supported by the Scottish Conservatives on the benches across there. Credit and the numbers of people and using food banks where universal credit has been rolled out, rolled out rose by 52%, and that includes thousands of hardworking families across Scotland. For the life of me, I cannot understand how the Scottish Conservatives can in this parliament claim they want to end food poverty when they will not call a halt for a major contributor of food poverty, the rollout of universal credit. So I say to them, if you generally want to address food poverty in Scotland, then you must be clear that we need to halt the rollout of universal credit. And when you're at it, we also need to speak up against full, failed Tory austerity, which is causing widespread food poverty in Scotland and across the United Kingdom. So undoubtedly, our food system is failing many of our citizens, from those experiencing food uncertainty, food poverty, and working in the food industry with low wages and insecure working conditions to those struggling with a diet related ill health and obesity, as well as a large number of food producers who are simply struggling to make a living. Also, as pointed out so passionately by Claudia Beamish, food is a major contributor to climate change and to biodiversity loss and is driving global soil quality loss and antibiotic resistance. An overarching bill could change this by underpinning a fair, healthy and sustainable food system and more specifically tackling food poverty. That is why Scottish Labour brought forward an amendment which I hope all members in this chamber can support. Surely no member in this chamber wants to vote against tackling food poverty. I urge support. I now call Rachel Hamilton for around eight minutes, please. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to speak in this debate tonight and celebrate Scotland's food and drinks success story. Scotland showcases some of the world's finest food and drink, as we've heard, and it's one of the reasons visitors come to Scotland. Presiding Officer, isn't it amazing that so many members have an inside knowledge of whisky and gins from their own regions and constituencies? I want to give some credit where credit is due, and in summing up, I will also set out why the Scottish Conservatives have misgivings about the Scottish Government's ambition. Please indulge me for a second, um, Presiding Officer, because I'd like to start by celebrating the success of the food producers in my own constituency of Ettrick, Roxburgh and Berwickshire. Uh, their tenacity and determination to put the best of the borders on the Scottish food map is second to none. There's no shortage of achievement in in my constituency um, and during the Great Taste Awards they were very successful. Jacopazzi's of Eyemouth with their ice cream and their yoghurt, Katie Cloud Marshmallows Jarvis Pickle for their Cullen Skink Pie and Lapwing Valley Fruits for their gorgeous apple juice. Last night we enjoyed the Food and Drink Federation reception which many members have mentioned and that was hosted by John Scott and the Cabinet Secretary was also, also there to see and hear the breadth of talent especially amongst the young people and their fantastic achievement, achievements through education and skills in the food and drink sector. And it is this point I'd like to pick up on later. We can definitely go further in promoting Scotland's unique food story and we must seize the vast opportunities that tourism can bring in promoting our food and drink industry. The Scottish Conservatives welcome the aim of the Scottish Government to grow the food and drink sector by 1 billion by 2030 via the Food Tourism Action Plan. Presiding officer, we've heard so many um, members this evening talk about the success and the outstanding success of exports up by 275 million to 5.5 million in 2016. That's an increase of 70% uh, since 2007. We can go on with the amazing figures. I don't need to repeat them, but they are outstanding. Going forward with Brexit, we do have a unique chance to craft an export plan which could take Scottish produce even further and many, many members have lauded uh, the success of the whiskey and salmon uh, industry on the world stage and however there is so much untapped potential out there that could really thrive in a global market. Presiding officer with all our wonderfully locally grown and high quality food it's no wonder people are a little bit disappointed at the SNP government's decision to effectively ditch the Good Food Nation Bill, and many of the other parties have talked about that too. We are just saddened that the SNP have um, decided to drop this from their 2018-19 programme for government, and Fergus Ewing did promise a Good Food Nation Bill back in May 2017. The commitment was included within that 2017 programme for government. The new programme for government mentions only proposals and actions there was cross-party consensus, so why drop it? I find myself asking, what kind of message does ditching this bill send out? What sort of message does it send to, I'll just finish this point, what sort of message does it send out to families, to crofters, to farmers, to fishermen, to our valued food producers, to schools, to our planet? How can we begin to properly shape Scotland's food policy without robust and considered leg legislation? I'll take an intervention. Fergus Ewing. I'm, I'm very grateful. Richard Hamilton's giving way and um, could, could I just reaffirm that we are committed as I said at the outset to uh, to bring forward legislation that will underpin Scotland as a good food nation but might I just correct Rachel Hamilton and previous speakers from the Conservatives that we did not say in the programme for government previously that we would introduce legislation we said we would consult we consult the public on good food legislation and that is exactly what we're going to do Rachel Hamilton. Thank you um, for the intervention. I, I just want to uh, uh, sort of clarify from the official report that the, that the Cabinet Secretary told the Parliament that decisions on the bill timetable will be taken in the context of the government's overall legislative programme. So I, I don't really know how that squares with um, the intervention that you've just said. And also, um, I'm being uh, urged to declare an interest, presiding officer. I, I do uh, in my own business, which I, I declare an interest of um, owning a local hotel. I do sell food and drink within that. So whether that is um, part of it, uh, but I just want to make sure about that. Um, 
just to um, develop my point here about the Good Food Bill, um, we could have um, seen public sector supply chains and food procurement involving Scottish producers set out in le legislation, which I presume um, the Cabinet Secretary is talking about with regard to the um, con consultation. We could have introduced legislation to improve children's health and healthy eating. That is now not go going to come to fruition unless the SNP bring back this. And Mark Russell has urged the Cabinet Secretary to do that, to get out of his economic silo. Many members wish the Cabinet to reconsider as well. Presiding officer, food producers are acutely aware of their carbon footprint and their impact on the environment. We see numerous producers um, from whiskey distilleries to fruit and veg growers working with Mother Nature to enhance not only their product but also the environment and biodiversity. Take for example whiskey. Pure clean water is crucial to the quality of finished product and the industry is carrying out some excellent work in working with SEPA to ensure pollution in watercourses is kept to a minimum. I'm sure that this good work will not be ignored but a good food bill could address regulation and some of the uh, quality standards and issues that we have certainly talked about today. Um, in other sectors of the food industry. Moving on to geographical indicators, the Scottish Conservatives recognise the importance of this and that's why we uh, included it within our amendment. The Scottish brand, brand is world renowned and going forward it's important we ensure that the brand we have is protected and any replacement scheme for GI must be at least an equivalent level of protection once the UK leaves the EU. I was quite interested by Colin Smith's comment uh, that um, it actually increases the value of products by at least 2.3 times. And that Excuse me, Ms Hamilton. Can, can I say to members that I don't know whether my hearing is particularly acute or voices are carrying more than usual today, but I'm actually feeling that I'm part of conversations and understanding them. It's that bad. So could I ask people to be a bit quieter? Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, presiding officer. It's like being a school teacher just before the bell goes. Uh, intellectual property is of huge value to producers and I urge the Scottish Government to work with the UK Government to support food producers. Um, many diverse subjects have been talked about uh, this evening and John Scott welcomed the six-month trial scheme for seasonal workers to tackle the labour shortages that have been pertinent within uh, the fruit industry and other um, food production units. However, I must add that worryingly, the new entrance uh, capital grant scheme closed to new applicants at the end of August, and new entrants who started farming in 2017 should have expected a scheme available for three years. This has now been cut short by 18 months. And I just wonder how we're meant to attract the next generation to pursue a career in agriculture to produce more food. If these opportunities are taken away from them, the Cabinet Secretary was happy last night to support young people at the Food and Drink Federation event, uh, but um, why is he now annou not announcing new support for entrance scheme to encourage young women and men to uh, get into farming? Um, just to conclude, um, we must remember it's the fishermen and the farmers at the end of the day who we must thank for producing the excellent raw ingredients upon which the Scottish success story is built. The Good Food Nation Bill could have enshrined the importance of food production in legislation and quite frankly it's a kick in the teeth for them. For them. Presiding officer, we simply cannot rest on our laurels. Farmers, fishermen, food producers, their hard work cannot be taken for granted. It's time that this FSMP government realised that and really pulled out the stops to support the industry to ensure that we can take food and drink, Scottish food and drink, to the next level. A good Food Nation bill would have done that. I now call Mary Gouchon to close the debate. Um, we have ended up with a couple of moments extra, so 12 minutes should take us up to decision time. A little space for interventions, I'm sure. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll certainly see what I can do. I, but I think before I get started, really, there is one point that I want to address at the outset of my contribution, and that is really uh, the points that Mike Rumble's raised in his contribution, both in summing up and in his opening statement. Because contrary to what he might think or believe, I believe that facts are important. And I do think that we cannot have a situation where these completely misleading statements and footage is made and displayed and allow that continu to continue without actually trying to clarify or give the truth of the situation. Now, I took a number of questions about this in the Chamber on Tuesday. This is something that I care deeply about and it is something that I actively am trying to do something about. 
because this is a situation, as I said then, and I'll repeat again now, that no one is happy with. And coming back to the, the issue of cows being transported out with the EU to third countries, now, in that documentary, that again, as I said to Mike Grumbles earlier, that was, we did not see any Scottish calves in that footage. And I'm not saying that that makes it okay. But what I am saying is that we specifically said to the BBC, if you have any footage or evidence of this taking place, give it to us. I would say that around the chamber today, if you have any footage or evidence, give that to us. I'd give way to the member. Mike Grumbles. Thank the Minister for taking the intervention. We mustn't get confused about this. I said the facts are important, but as important as the facts is public perception. Also, on the BBC programme, it made it clear that they weren't from Scotland that they introduced. They said that in the programme. That doesn't take away from the fact that 5,000 were exported last year, and I'd like to know what the Minister is actually doing about it. Marie Gouchon. I feel like Mike Rumbles is conflating a few issues there because, yes, 5,000 calves were exported, but you're, it's from the statements that you make, you're making it sound like 5,000 calves were exported out with the EU to these third countries. But that's exactly, the, but the comments that Mike Rumbles has made is the way he's making that come across. And that's exactly, he talks about public perception being important, that's exactly what I'm trying to clarify and get right. And when I said that I'm actively trying to work to do something about it, that is what I'm genuinely trying to do. I said, I'll take an intervention in a moment, I said that I would engage with the dairy industry. Again, it's a situation nobody's happy with and we want to try and tackle it. And Mark Ruskell raised a very good point in his closing there about Rosie Veal. Absolutely, I understand where he's coming from, I accept that, and absolutely I will work and I will meet with any member in this chamber who wants to discuss this with me and who wants to seriously discuss this issue and try and find a way forward. Colin Smith. Will Mary Gujano accept that as long as we have live animal exports for, for fattening and for slaughter continuing, the government cannot, cannot guarantee that calves will not be exported from Scotland and could ultimately land in countries whose, whose processes are far, far inferior to our own. You cannot guarantee that will not happen as long as we allow the export of live animals to continue for for slaughter and for fattening. Answer, to answer Colin Smith, that is exactly why we are undertaking the research that we're currently undertaking, to try to make sure that that isn't happening. That's not what we believe is happening. And again, if there's evidence of that, please give it to me. I want to see it. I put that call out there, so give it to me so that we can act on it and do something about it. Yeah. And again, coming back to what Mark Ruskell said about this being a, a tale of two debates today, couldn't agree more with that either. And so I think that I'll probably uh, go between the two as I progress with my, with, my, uh, with my speech this afternoon. Because what I did want to start with was the fact that it is actually good to have the opportunity to take part in this debate today and to bring it to a close in my new capacity as Minister for Rural Affairs. Because if there's one thing that I'm learning in this role, it's that it is certainly not without its challenges. But there are areas of this, like food and drink, where, yes, again, there are challenges, which I will come on to later, but there is also a great deal of opportunity and excitement. Because who can't get excited uh, and passionate when it comes to Scotland's food and drink? Now is the time that we celebrate that and enjoy it as part of Food and Drink Fortnight, which runs until the end of this week. And as part of that, I've had the opportunity to meet with a number of people, businesses and organisations to see the innovation that is happening and to see for myself what action the government in partnership with others are taking to support this vital sector. And that's not just in terms of pure production, but also wider learning, training and career development. Last week, I met with Bob and Jane Prentice at Downfield Farm in Fife to launch the Venison Strategy. Now, this is the culmination of work from those who are involved in the industry and what was the first time that all key representatives from across the whole supply chain covering wild and farm deer worked together to develop a plan that would see the growth of that sector. And this strategy aims to improve and establish new supply chains, build and strengthen skills and looking at how to support new entrants to deer farming amongst many others. Now, venison is a growing sector for us here in Scotland and we have a real opportunity here to further build and develop it. 
Last week, we've heard a lot about this event tonight, the Scotch Whisky Association. Uh, I spoke at that event celebrating their success and in particular to celebrate the fact that there are now 128 distilleries across Scotland. And that ranges from the old distilleries to the new to the truly historic. Lindor's Abbey, for example, which uh, Jenny Gilruth talked about in her contribution today. Uh, and that was where the first distilling is said to have taken place. And now, 500 years on, we've seen the rebirth of whisky production there through the vision of the Mackenzie Smiths. Whisky is just one of Scotland's great success stories. And that's evident when you look at the exports that we see from last year, worth £4.37 billion pounds and up 55% from 2007. On Monday this week, I visited Forth Valley College in Stirling, where with the charity Springboard, they were undertaking work with secondary schools across the region. Now that work was focused around hospitality, food and, food and tourism, and it just really aimed to show young people the wide variety of careers and opportunities that are available right across the sector by giving them small tasters of each. And this was also something that I was able to take part in. We had a session from Historic Environment Scotland, then we had a session with a team from Andy Murray's Cromlex Hotel making mocktails and for everyone's information I make a cracking Shirley Temple uh, as well as sessions with the chef where we competed in an omelette challenge and that's where I was also devastated to learn that I make an omelette more slowly than both Jamie Hepburn and Fiona Hislop but all I can say about that is their omelettes must have been completely inedible in the time it took them but it was just fantastic across those three sessions it was really just fantastic to see the enthusiasm not just from the young people themselves but from the people who were del delivering those sessions and who really brought those jobs and those careers to life because if we want to grow and develop our food and drink sector and fully realize all the opportunities we, ho we hope to achieve on our way to becoming a good food nation having the skills and enthusiasm to help deliver all of that is a vital component of it uh, yes Finley Carson would the Minister recognise the great disappointment uh, that uh, many of the, the companies and the food sector in general have that uh, the Good Food Nation Bill is not included in this year's programme for government? Minister. I would say we do have plans uh, to legislate in certain areas and I think it's about it's not just about legislation though because there are a number of actions we can take forward without the legislation to do it and we had that point emphasised from James Withers of Scotland Food and Drink today. Now, finally, this Saturday, I'll be visiting the Stranraer Oyster Festival to celebrate and enjoy that fantastic product. Uh, and the Oyster Festival was highlighted by Colin Smith and Emma Harper uh, in their contributions this afternoon. Now, the talent, enthusiasm and dedication from all of those involved across our food and drink sector right across the country is very clear for everyone to see. And it's something we've heard about right across the chamber this afternoon from individual MSPs constituencies. Colin Smith talked about the cream of Galloway and Dumfries and Galloway having 40% of Scotland's dairy. Uh, the the special South Korean bar snacks that we heard about from Gillian Martin uh, in her constituency, the micro brewing in Fife mentioned by Jenny Gilruth, the award winning butchers and grocers in Burnt Island that we heard about from Claire Baker, Stuart McMillan talked about the trout fishery in his constituency, the vegan cheesemaker, and about the little treats he's left for everyone in their offices today. And Emma Harper mentioned in addition, I'm sorry, I don't have the time now, I'm afraid. Uh, but Emma Harper mentioned in addition to Dumfries and Galloway's dairy products, the Galloway chilies, which is also something I look forward to trying. And I don't think I can talk about this without mentioning Stornoway Black Pudding, raised by Alistair Allen, a product which fu fueled Jenny Goldruth and I on our run around at the Stornoway Half Marathon, and one which Angus MacDonald knows how to make. So all good knowledge. But there is no way I could talk about all of this today without talking about my own constituency and the amazing work that's happening there. We've talked about the food tourism, tourism strategy today. Brechin has that perfectly encapsulated. From Brechin, you can catch the slow train, that's slow with an E, at the Caledonian Railway, a steam train which takes you to Dunn and where along the way you can sample gin bothy gins. Lawrence Kirk is home to Alison Stewart's Cakes by Alibaba, winner of the best baked goods in Scotland earlier this year at the 2018 Scotland's Business Awards. And in Montrose, we have the restaurant El Tajin. Established by Mexican chef Martha Doyle and her family, they use the best of local produce to inspire their Mexican menu. And they really do utilize all the very best that the area has to offer. From the Smokies in our broth, the geese from Inverbervie and goats from Inverkeeler. 
to make truly original creations such as goat tacos. So I would encourage anybody, if they're in the area, to take the time to visit. As I said, it's hard not to be passionate about this sector as a whole, but at the same time, we have to be aware of the challenges. Amongst one of those is Brexit, one that Mike Grumbles was hoping we didn't think we needed to talk about, and one which Peter Chapman says he sees as an opportunity, one which I would very much beg to differ with. Now, I realise that these aren't the only challenges we face because others were articulated by members across the chamber today. Claudia Beamish talked about access to healthy food, local food, our food culture. Edward Mountain and John Scott talked about livestock and the challenges facing farmers. There's health and food poverty, which a number of members raised. Claire Baker and Colin Smith raised concern about food poverty, as did Mark Ruskell, as well as health, concerned that we wouldn't link that with a food strategy. Now, this is intrinsic to the work towards a good food nation, and that's what I want to highlight today. It's discussed, it is discussed in the progress report that was published this week, and it's something that's going to be integral as part of this work as we move forward. Now, the fact that we're accepting the vast majority of the amendments in the chamber today I really hope would show members that we recognise the concerns that have been raised across the chamber and we want to work together to do something about it. Now Donald Cameron and Mark Ruskell raised concern about the political will here and I would assure those members and other members right across the chamber the political will is there. Food poverty, health, food production, access to local food, education, access to the food and drink sector, job opportunities, valued jobs in the sector, skills, top quality produce available here in Scotland and our local communities and abroad. All vitally important, interlinked and exactly what we want to tackle and address on our way to becoming a good food nation. I am committed to this, the Scottish Government is committed to this and I hope we can see some consensus and cooperation across the Chamber to make that happen. Thank you very much and that concludes our debate on celebrating Scotland's food and drink success story and we'll turn straight away to decision time. The first question is that amendment 13876.1 in the name of Donald Cameron which seeks to amend motion 13876 in the name of Fergus Ewing on celebrating Scotland's food and drink success story be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 13876.1 in the name of Donald Cameron is yes 62, no 58. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 13876.4 in the name of Colin Smith, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Fergus Ewing, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 13876.3 in the name of Mark Ruskell, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Fergus Ewing be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 13876.2 in the name of Mike Rumbles, which seeks to amend the, name, the motion in the name of Fergus Ewing be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 13876.2 in the name of Mike Rumbles is yes, 117, no, zero, and there were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. 
The final question is that motion 13876 in the name of Fergus Ewing as amended on celebrating Scotland's food and drink success story be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 13876 in the name of Fergus Ewing as amended is yes 62, no 0 and there were 58 abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.